Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure and honor to open this session, opening session of 2022 NEREC Sejong International Conference on Nuclear Non-Proliferation. Uh, this morning, some of us, before this session, uh, were talking about what is going on these days in the world. We are saying, we are truly experiencing renaissance in nuclear energy as well as nuclear debates. So it's very timely uh, and relevant to have this conference, especially here in Sejong Institute. Sejong Institute is a premier national think tank, private think tank in South Korea, addressing many of the important strategic global national regional issues. Some people say 21st century truly started with the arrival of COVID-19 pandemic as well as Russo-Ukraine war. Now we are heading toward this new era, this unprecedented era with uncertainty. And we are here to collect ideas, share insights, to learn from each other in terms of how to cope with all these challenges ahead of us. So in this conference, we're going to be addressing many of the issues uh, facing us. But before that, we are going to have a opening congratulatory remarks from the chairman of the board of Sejong Institute, uh, Dr. Chung In Moon. So let me briefly introduce uh, our speaker. Uh, Dr. Jung In Moon is the chairman of Sejong Institute a leading private think tank in South Korea. He served as a special advisor to South Korea president for foreign affairs and national security between 2017 and 2021. He is also a distinguished university professor at Yonsei University, Klaus Distinguished Fellow at School of Global Policy and Strategy at University of San California, San Diego, and editor-in-chief of Global Asia, a quarterly journal in English. He's also vice chairman and executive director of APLN, Asia Pacific Leadership Network for Nuclear Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. He was dean of the Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei University and served as an ambassador for international security affairs for South Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he's uh, uh, also chairman of the Presidential Committee on Northeast Asian Cooperation Leadership, a cabinet level post and currently serving as also a distinguished invited professor at KAIST. Uh, Dr. Jung In Moon, uh, we really appreciate your presence here. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to come physically on, uh, on site, but we're very grateful to have you to deliver this message. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Im. <laughs> and in fact, you know, the Sejong Institute is now at the you know, summer vacation, therefore we are uh, you know, on vacation for two weeks. Therefore, I'm staying at home, <laughs> and uh, that's why I could not uh, join you physically there. Uh, anyhow, thank you very much, Professor Im, and welcome to the Sejong Institute. And it is my great pleasure and honor to give congratulatory remarks at the NAREC Sejong Conference on Nuclear non-proliferation. On behalf of the Sejong Institute, I would like to express my cordial thanks uh, to the NAREP for co-hosting the conference and to participants of the conference. I'm familiar with the NAREP and its activities. I myself gave several talks at the conference in the past. And also when, when I was a, a vice chair and the executive director of APLN, I also had the opportunities to co-sponsor NEREC related activities. By the way, I'm no longer serving as an executive director. I still serve as a vice chair, uh, but I no longer serve as executive director. Uh, I believe the NEREC has uh, established itself as one of the most visible and influential international non-governmental organizations in Asia in promoting nuclear non-proliferation and the peaceful use of nuclear energy throughout the world. Its mission to train future young leaders 
and specialists in the area and to cultivate dance human networks among them have been remarkably successful. Its longevity has also impressed me uh, quite extensively. All this stellar performance could have never been possible without personal commitment and leadership of Professor Man Sang Im. I recommend him very highly. Uh, Dr. Steve Miller, Professor Scott Sagan, and several other prominent scholars in the field have also greatly contributed to the success of the program. We are now facing new nuclear realities. The Ukraine war and the Russian threat to use nuclear weapons have been alarming the world about the fear of a catastrophic nuclear escalation. Preventing the nuclear escalation, as well as preserving the existing global nuclear governance have emerged as a new urgent policy challenges. The North Korean nuclear quagmire is still unresolved and the security situation on the Korean Peninsula is becoming worse. Whereas the war in Ukraine might have tempted the North Korean leadership not to give up its nuclear ambition and its nuclear doctrine to change to uh, nuclear doctrinal change to adopt an offensive use of tactical nuclear weapons in addition to its traditional minimal nuclear deterrence is breeding new security reality and new security dilemma on the Korean Peninsula. The Ukrainian war has also triggered a crisis of energy security throughout the world, which has in turn ironically led to the renewed emphasis on the peaceful use of nuclear energy. This year's NARA conference is dealing with these issues. Impacts of the Ukraine war on nuclear governance, the North Korean nuclear quagmire, and the peaceful use of nuclear energy are all relevant, timely, and important topics. I hope that this conference would produce new insights and innovative policy ideas uh, through in-depth analysis and hard and open de debates. The Sejong Institute will continue to cooperate with the NERA. Dr. Sang Hyun Lee, president of Sejong Institute, has been working closely with Professor Im Man Sung, and I hope that their mutual cooperation would result in a great, greater success in the future. I again congratulate the event and wish the success of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Moon. Your support is truly appreciated. Thank you. Now I'm going to introduce uh, the keynote speaker for this morning's opening session. Our speaker is Dr. Stephen Miller from Harvard Belper Center. Uh, obviously, he doesn't need an introduction. He's a household name in nuclear non-proliferation policy community, uh, but uh, it is my distinct pleasure or privilege to introduce him. In fact, Professor Miller is the only international speaker who was physically able to travel and come to the, the conference site. So that's <laughs> especially appreciated. <laughs> Professor Stephen Miller is a director of international security program at Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He also serves as the editor-in-chief of the scholarly journal International Security and co-editor of International Security Program's book series, BCSIS Studies in International Security, uh, which is published by MIT Press. Previously, he was a senior research fellow at Stockholm International Peace Research Institute called CIPRI in Stockholm, Sweden, and was an assistant professor teaching defense and arms control studies in the Department of Political Science at the MIT. Uh, professor Miller is a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Science, where he has long been a member of and formerly chaired the Committee on International Security Studies. He is active in the Pugwash Conference on Science and World Affairs, an international scholarly association based in Rome, is co-chair of U.S. Pugwash Committee, a member of the Council of International Pugwash, and chair of the executive program of International Pugwash. Professor Miller has written extensively on nuclear weapons issues, U.S. security policy, and U.S. foreign policy, 
has written an, or co-authored Soviet Union nuclear fission, control of nuclear arsenal in disintegrating Soviet Union, avoiding nuclear anarchy, containing the threat of loose Russian fissile material and nuclear weapons, war and with Iraq, cost consequences and alternatives, nuclear collision, discord, reform, and nuclear non proliferation regime, and etc. cetera. Uh, Professor Miller also serves as the member of International Advisory Board of NEREC. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Miller as keynote speaker this morning. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Mansung. It's always a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, grateful uh, to NEREC and to the Sejong Institute uh, for including me in, in this event, and I'm very happy to be at, at the Sejong Institute, whose work I've admired for a very long time. <clears throat> this is uh, the ninth uh, NEREC summer program, and this is my ninth time participating in the NEREC summer program, uh, which tells you a little something about what I think of it. I think it's a wonderful uh, and very worthwhile uh, endeavor, and I've committed myself to uh, participating uh, so long as I, I am invited. Uh, it's always a welcome opportunity to, to come to Korea. I have to say that I like everything about Korea except the weather in August. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> let me share uh, a few thoughts with you about uh, where things stand with respect to the nonproliferation regime. Uh, I'm going to provide a kind of framework uh, and touch upon a, a number of issues that will kind of set things up, and I think many of these uh, topics we will come back to in more detail uh, in the course of this rich two days we have uh, ahead of us. As most of you will know, uh, just this week in New York, we've had the beginning of the uh, 2020 Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty Review Conference delayed as so many things have been for two years by the, by the pandemic. So this is meant to be the 2020 uh, review conference. Uh, so it's a time of, of uh, stock taking and appraisal. It's a moment of assessment. It's a context within which much of the politics of the NPT system plays out in these NPT review conferences. It, it's a moment where states air their grievances and their complaints and their dissatisfactions. It's also uh, an environment in which efforts are made to launch new initiatives that might strengthen and improve the regime. So it's a, it's a consequential moment in the history of the nonproliferation system. We also understand, as uh, Professor Yim foreshadowed in his open, opening remarks, we understand that this review conference is happening in what amounts to almost a different world. Uh, and in part, this has to do with the fact that we collectively as humanity have experienced uh, a global pandemic which has disrupted so many things, uh, the timetable of many of our activities, the ways in which we interact, and of course it has impinged on the, on the non-proliferation system as well. Uh, but more than that, there, there are a number of uh, factors, contextual factors, uh, which I think will influence the atmosphere within which uh, the political uh, uh, ambiance in which uh, the NPT review conference takes place. I thought I'd start by touching uh, uh, on, a, on a few of those. Uh, the first and, and most obvious overshadowing much else, I think, uh, is the war in Ukraine, uh, a, a really shocking development, something that has really had a, had a very dramatic, uh, shocking effect in Europe because they thought they were living in one world, a world of peace, a w world of Europe whole and free, uh, and now they discover uh, that they live in a very different world, a world of aggressor states, violence, good old-fashioned, ugly uh, war. Uh, for the non-proliferation uh, world, this uh, war has at least three uh, implications. First of all, I think it has revived a, an argument about the value of nuclear weapons. Because there is a school of thought that basically says, if Ukraine had retained the nuclear weapons that it inherited from the Soviet Union, if it was a nuclear armed state, if it had a capacity to protect itself against extreme scenarios by the threat of nuclear use, none of this would have happened. Ukraine would not have been attacked. Russia would not have dared to, to make this move. 
Uh, and so what does this imply for uh, Iran, for example, or other states that might be, be inhabiting very difficult security environments? It's an argument for the acquisition or the retention uh, of nuclear weapons. I happen to think this argument is wrong because uh, for several reasons, but above all because Ukraine never really uh, really had operational control of the nuclear weapons on its territory uh, in, in the early 90s when the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, the whole world was against Ukraine retaining its nuclear weapons along with the other newly independent states. Uh, for Ukraine, uh, it was offered a, a stark choice between recognition and uh, uh, integration with or at least some relationships with the major institutions of the Western world or the retention of of nuclear weapons, uh, and they chose to join the world rather than keep the weapons on their territory. But I actually think that, that had Ukraine tried to become a nuclear armed state in the early 1990s, the war would have happened then rather than now because the Russians wouldn't have put up with it. And we would have had, we the United States, would have had considerable sympathy with the Russian position because the United States government and the presidency of uh, George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, was totally opposed to proliferation of nuclear weapons to the new states that emerged after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But that's one uh, important argument, I think, that is out there. And the more common view, I fear, is not mine, but the argument that Ukraine should have kept its nuclear weapons because that would have protected it from the kind of attacks that it's now experiencing. Uh, the second thing we've... Uh, seen in the Ukraine war that it bears on the non-proliferation question is the assaults on the reactors. The, the Russians have taken over the Chernobyl reactor and they've uh, also taken possession of, but uh, earlier uh, attacked the Zaporozhye uh, reactor uh, complex, which is the largest nuclear facility in Europe. They've also behaved very irresponsibly in terms of how they've treated the, both the facilities and the personnel. Uh, and what this shows is quite vividly the dangers of having nuclear infrastructure in the context of ongoing conflict. Uh, there's actually uh, IAEA uh, resolutions that ban uh, attacks on and uh, uh, irresponsible behavior toward reactors, and this has had about the same effect on Russian behavior as all of the other agreements and uh, norms that they've been, been violating. Uh, the last and potentially, I think, the most uh, consequential implication of the Ukraine uh, war is that going back to its origins, going back to the, the very negotiation of the NPT itself, the NPT system has rested to a striking degree on collaboration between Washington and Moscow. It was really the ability of the superpowers to see the common interest that they shared in preventing the spread of nuclear weapons that made the NPT possible, that made the NPT system function. And what we have now as a consequence of the Ukraine war is a severe rupture in relations between the United States and Russia. As bad as I have ever seen it, and sadly I'm an old guy now, so I've been watching these uh, relationships for a very long time. Uh, for the past uh, half year, there has been essentially zero contact between the US government and the Russian government. All venues of interaction have been severed, torn apart. Uh, the mood in Washington is all about punishing Russia and teaching Putin a lesson. Right? There is very little left of this notion that even in the most difficult moments, we have certain shared interests that are best undertaken collaboratively. And uh, so when you look forward, Will the Russians continue to be helpful and cooperative on the Iran issue? The Russians are by far the number one supplier of nuclear exports. As you know, are they going to continue to conform to Western and American preferences with respect to the criteria they apply to their nuclear exports? Uh, will they continue to be uh, partners in the non-proliferation enterprise, or will this be another area of, of Moscow-Washington friction and competition? And that, I think, really has the potential across time if this horrible rupture persists to have, a, have an undermining effect on the nonproliferation system because it really has been that, 
that uh, collaboration that has been at the, at the core of, of things. So arguments about uh, the utility of nuclear weapons, uh, concerns about uh, nuclear infrastructure in the context of ongoing conflict, and the damage to the fundamental political relationship which has been so essential to uh, making the NPT system function effectively. Those, I think, are three big nuclear implications of the Ukraine war. A second important contextual factor is uh, the uh, potential demise of the Iran nuclear deal, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, often described as the JCPOA. Uh, we don't know the end of that story as of this moment. Uh, it's been ongoing since, the, since Biden came into office. We've had a year and a half of painful and so far fruitless negotiations. The current uh, reporting of what's happening suggests uh, that things are not going well and that it's quite possible that the agreement will meet its end. Uh, at a minimum, what we have seen is how difficult it is to deal with a deeply entrenched non-proliferation crisis. The Iran issue has been ongoing for more than two decades. We still don't have a satisfactory resolution of it. Uh, we don't, we don't, still don't have <clears throat> an ability to, uh, to uh, interact with Iran in a way that reflects a sort of common understandings and a shared language and a, and a preferred joint outcome. And if the JCPOA fails, which may happen soon, uh, I think one very large implication for the NPT system is that this raises the risk yet again of proliferation-related violence, of conflict. Uh, we've seen this in the past, uh, the famous is Israeli raid on Osirak in Iraq. We've seen the Israeli raid on the, the reactor under construction in Syria. We've seen the American war in, in Iraq in 2003 justified largely on the basis of Iraq's suspected uh, ongoing programs, uh, WMD programs, and we have seen uh, uh, time and time again in the case of the Iran nuclear program concerns that Israel or the United States or both might take military action in order to set back Iran's uh, nuclear program. If it appears that the diplomatic path is going to be completely unsuccessful and Iran's program continues to progress, and those of you who follow it know that they're now within weeks of being able, able to produce a, at least a weapon's worth of, of uh, special nuclear materials for a bomb. Uh, this is going to be uh, a signal failure of our nonproliferation policies. It will be a sing single, singular blow against the nonproliferation regime. Uh, and this failure, the, one has to ask at some point how many failures can the regime take before it's widely, uh, widely questioned. Uh, but in addition, there's another dimension of uh, the, the potential death of the JCPOA, which I don't think gets enough attention. And that is that, that uh, although it's, it's fashionable, at least in the United States, to describe the JCPOA as flawed or imperfect, the, the uh, critics of the JCPOA have put the the supporters on the defensive so that you feel like you have to start off every, every uh, comment by saying, of course, the JCPOA is flawed. However, it's actually quite a remarkable document, and it's, and it's unprecedented in a number of respects. No other state has ever accepted limits on levels of enrichment. That is not part of the normal NPT regime. No, no other state has ever expected restrictions on both numbers and modernization of uh, centrifuges. That's absolutely unprecedented. No other state has ever expected uh, daily, in, uh, daily insp has never accepted daily inspections of its uh, key nuclear facilities. No other state has ever expected, a, a, has ever accepted a, an inspection regime that covers the entire fuel cycle from mining and milling to waste. All of this is unprecedented. All of this is desirable. All of this would be better than the normal IAEA inspection system. Right? These are innovations that we ought to be praising and trying to widen <laughs> rather than letting them die in a, in a brutal uh, diplomatic collision between us and a regime that we don't like. So we have the Ukraine war. We have the 
crisis over the JCPOA. A third point, which I'll touch on very briefly because you folks in this room will know more about it than I, but we have, of course, the unresolved North Korean uh, nuclear and missile crisis. Uh, and I just put that there as a, as a contextual fact here without elaborating because I know you all know much about it and we'll talk much more about it. But here again, what you have is a protracted inability of the system to cope with a long-standing uh, crisis. And uh, there is one important caveat which is singular to the North Korean case, which is North Korea is the one and only state that has exercised its legal option to withdraw from the NPT. And, and that's a, an important and unfortunate precedent that gets invoked occasionally, for example, by the Arab League when they get frustrated by this, what they see as the special treatment of Israel. But we have an Article 10 problem in the NPT, which is a very permissive withdrawal clause. And one has to worry about, as all of these frictions and, and problems accumulate, whether more states in the future will exercise that right. Uh, the fourth contextual factor, uh, I've really put kind of two concerns here together, but one is the near total collapse of arms control. This has been happening for the last 25 years, but it really accelerated under President Trump. Uh, so INF gone, JCPOA withdrawn, Open Skies withdrew. Uh, in the case of strategic arms control, uh, Trump did nothing to uh, uh, prepare for a follow-on agreement to the new, new start. Biden came in and, and prolonged it. But basically, we had about uh, four decades from about 1960 until about the year 2000 of slow, difficult, painful, but steady progress in the construction of a very elaborate architecture of arms control that shaped forces and force postures that controlled and regulated modernization, but also that put in place an array of crisis management mechanisms and transparency measures and so on. You know, Open Skies Agreement was really a transparency measure. Virtually all of it is gone at this moment. The only thing is, that's left is a New START, which is a bilateral US-Russian agreement. And at this moment, there doesn't appear to be any prospect that there will be a follow-on negotiation because, because of this rupture in US-Russian relations. And it expires in about four years now and uh, if it expires without a follow-on agreement, it would be the first time in about four decades when the nuclear environment was completely unregulated by any arms control uh, measures. And in the NPT context, the question is, how do you justify this in connection with, or in the context of the Article VI uh, obligation of the nuclear weapon states to work toward nuclear disarmament. And at the same time that arms control has been massively eroded, what we are seeing across almost all of the nuclear weapon states is a recommitment to nuclear weapons, a reviving of their nuclear program, their nuclear weapons programs, uh, a, a long-term uh, expensively committed uh, program of expansion and modernization almost across the board. So the United States, under President Joe Biden, inheriting a nuclear modernization program that had its origins under President Barack Obama, so these are the moderate guys in the American context, we are pursuing a $1.5 trillion, trillion with a T, strategic modernization program to replace and upgrade every single component of our nuclear weapons posture, the delivery systems, and with tens of billions of dollars invested in uh, renovating our nuclear weapons production complex. And the goal of this long-term modernization program is by the year 2050 to have in place a completely modernized strategic nuclear arsenal that will last the United States to the end of this century, to the end of the 21st century. 
And so then you ask yourself, how do you square this? How do you make this vision of America's nuclear future compatible with our obligations under Article 6 to work toward nuclear disarmament? I know the American case best, so I use that, but if you know anything about the Russians, you know that they're actually ahead of the Americans. They're about half a lap ahead of the United States in terms of the timing of their uh, nuclear uh, modernization program. The Russians are developing a nuclear-powered cruise missile. The Russians are developing a nuclear-armed uh, torpedo. They are developing hypersonic glide delivery vehicles. Uh, the, the arms race is moving into outer space. We now have a cyber dimension of the nuclear arms race. Uh, what we have is a lot of momentum <laughs> behind both the collapse of arms control and the modernization of nuclear postures. And if you know anything about the history of NPT review conferences, the Article 6 issue has been a controversy from the, from the very first uh, review conference that was held in 1975. Because there was a deal here in which states accepted their non-nuclear status. They agreed to give up their rights to nuclear weapons in return for a commitment from the nuclear weapon states that this would not be a, a permanently uh, uh, divided world between the haves and the have-nots. So uh, however nonchalant or complacent Washington and Moscow and Beijing and other nuclear armed states may be about the Article 6 issue, the reality is that among a number of the opinion leaders around the developing world, people do care about Article 6 and they do believe that it's a serious obligation and they do believe that there should be tangible progress uh, in, in the right direction uh, if, if the NPT bargain is going to be uh, acceptable, continue to be uh, acceptable. So that's a, a real uh, dilemma, I think. And here, what we've seen since the 2015 review conference is a steep decline in arms control and a steep rise in modernization and expansion. So that this is a, a difference from, from past uh, deals, past uh, review conferences. And then the last uh, contextual factor I'll touch on, uh, there are obviously many others that I could, could uh, identify, but I think these are big ones and uh, I don't want to spend too much time here. But uh, what we saw in the interval since uh, the last NPT review conference was the negotiation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW. And to some extent, this reflects a wide international frustration with the behavior of the nuclear armed states, with the failure to uh, take seriously the Article 6 obligation with the lack of any real evidence that there's genuine movement in the direction of, of nuclear restraint. Right? And it has big potential implications for the NPT system because there is a, a, a non-trivial school of thought out there, particularly among some of our European colleagues, that the TPNW, as it's usually called, is actually a, a preferable alternative to the NPT, right? Because it calls for a complete ban on nuclear weapons for everybody. No exceptions, no exemptions, no fuzzy language. Right? So for example, uh, Tom Sauer at the University of Antwerp has written that, that non-nuclear weapon state members of the NPT should withdraw from the agreement and if they haven't already done so, sign and ratify the TPNW. The effect is the same for them, which is they're committed to be non-nuclear, but they're no longer associated with this flawed NPT system, which allows some people to have nuclear weapons and pretend they're committed to disarmament, uh, while others are, are treated as pariahs, even if they pursue what they claim as civil nuclear programs. So what we have in the TPNW, I think, is not only a sign of the frustration that many parties have around the world with the, the Article 6 controversy. But in addition, a kind of institutionalization of the polarization between those who think that nuclear weapons are undesirable, illegal, unlawful, immoral, and those who believe that nuclear weapons are necessary, important, essential to our security, right? The NATO strategic concept, which is the 
sort of broad strategy for the most powerful alliance in the history of the planet that is led by the most powerful state in the history of the planet says in its strategic concept that nuclear weapons provide an indispensable contribution to our security. Well, if that's true for the United States and if that's true for NATO and all of the so-called nuclear protected states, why not Iran? Why not, why not Ukraine? What about small, weak states? Wouldn't they benefit from nuclear weapons more than big, powerful states? Because they have many fewer capacities to, to defend themselves. So I think the, NP, the TPNW reflects that very stark polarization between the proponents and the critics of, of uh, nuclear weapons. And there I think you see a collision, political collision potentially happening. And one of the places it may happen is at the NPT review conference. Well, so I've painted here a somewhat <laughs> gloomy picture. Uh, it, it, it looks like the setting for the NPT review conference is quite troubled. Uh, it's easy to uh, be uh, pessimistic about the prospects for this NPT review conference. Uh, and so let me step back from the immediate uh, p uh, moment for a second and put this gloomy picture in a somewhat wider context. Because the truth is that throughout its history, uh, the NPT has been marked by friction, fights, failure. At least half of the NPT review conferences that have taken place are regarded as failures in the sense that they were unable to achieve a final document, or in, in one case in 2005, because the Bush administration uh, was a, a very bellicose mood, uh, they failed even to agree on an agenda for the, they spent an entire month in New York arguing over what the agenda should be and never succeeded and then disbanded without. Uh, and of course, there's been a peri periodic crises of the NPT system. In addition, there have, been long, uh, there have long been dissatisfied groupings within the NPT. The non-aligned movement, for example, uh, is uh, quite regularly very critical of the state of affairs within the NPT system. And at every NPT review conference, they put in a white paper. At this point, it's basically each white paper is a variation of the last white paper. And they complain about Article 6, and they complain about export controls, which they think deny them the rights that they were promised under the NPT to, for access to nuclear uh, uh, technology. They complain about discriminatory behavior. Why does India get treated separately and specially? Why does Israel gets special treatment, right? This is discrimination. They complain uh, always about Article 6. They complain even about uh, nuclear protected states. You know, we, 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 we focus on the five acknowledged nuclear weapon states and the four others, uh, so nine total nuclear armed states. But there are 30 states that enjoy the protection of nuclear weapons by virtue of the nuclear guarantees from the United States. So 30 out of the roughly 200, 15% of the international system enjoys the protection of nuclear weapons. Well, why should some parties enjoy the, the indispensable security provided by nuclear weapons and many others not? So this is viewed as hypocrisy. It's viewed as discrimination uh, and they don't like it. Well, the, the non-aligned movement is 125 member states and 25 observer states, so it's 150 of the 193 members of the UN. So this is not a trivial piece of the international community. It's most of the international community finds itself objecting to various features of the NPT system as it exists. If you go on Bill Potter's uh, Monterey Middlebury Institute uh, website, he has a section where he uh, collects all of the documents of the non-aligned movement related to NPT, and you can read through these documents and, and see for yourself. Uh, but the Arab League, the Arab League, 22 member states, is uh, routinely and regularly uh, objecting to various, uh, what they see as discriminatory aspects of the NPT, particularly in, comp in the way Israel is treated compared to the way Arab and Middle Eastern states are treated. Various Western uh, hawks uh, uh, find the NPT system ineffectual, weak, 
the inability to deal with these long-standing crises is a big uh, uh, wound to the NPT system as they see it. So lots of dissatisfied parties, and this has long been true. So lots of friction, lots of failure, lots of criticism. Uh, nevertheless, this is the 10th NPT review conference. This is a system that has survived uh, for more than 50 years. And it's not just survived. When it started in the 1970s, it had only a few dozen uh, members. Now it's the most universal treaty regime in the entire international system. Over a period of decades, state after state after state uh, has joined the NPT. So it's not that the system is falling apart, it's the system has become almost comprehensive. Uh, in addition, the, the uh, safeguard system, which started out in a very pr primitive and simple way, has evolved across time to become much more elaborate, much more sophisticated, much more transparency involved. And there's, it's difficult to make progress, and there's always resistance to make progress, and the states that need to be inspected always say, why are we always asked to do more when you're not fulfilling your obligations, you nuclear weapon states? Nevertheless, there's constant efforts to improve the system. So we have a bigger, wider, more comprehensive system that functions more effectively now than it did at, at its origins. And it, in the largest picture, the largest picture frame, in, 19, in the 1960 presidential campaign, President Kennedy famously predicted that there might be as many as, what was it, 25 nuclear armed states by the mid-70s. Uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara, likewise. There was a, an expectation in those days that any state that wanted nuclear weapons and had the technical capacity and the financial resources to afford them would get nuclear weapons. And in one of the more famous early pieces of work in the arms control literature, Albert Wolstetter wrote about what he called life in a nuclear armed crowd. Because the fear was that this would be a fairly common phenomenon. And yet here we are, seven decades into the nuclear age. There are only nine nuclear armed states. So somehow the system has been successful in restraining uh, numbers of nuclear armed states. Uh, so on the one hand, we see this very troubled picture, and on the other hand, we see a, a mechanism that has done rather well at achieving its core purpose. Well, that I think brings us uh, to uh, what I think of as sort of the core puzzle of, of the NPT, and I'll, uh, this will be my last sort of subset in, in my remarks. Uh, but we live in a world in which 184 of the 193 member states of the United Nations have judged that their interests are best served by choosing not to have nuclear weapons. Most of the international system prefers to live in a non-nuclear world. Why? That's the question, why? <laughs> That's what makes, it's that choice that makes the NPT possible. And I think it's especially a puzzle if you think about what I was saying about the way in which the nuclear weapon states justify their own possession, right? They insist, the United States insists Russia insists that nuclear weapons provide unique and indispensable contributions to their security. That these are valuable, legitimate, sovereignty protecting instruments. So why should states <laughs> choose not to have them? And there's another aspect of the puzzle, which is who would be capable of having them? Well, Israel is thought to have had nuclear weapons by 1970, probably by the late 1960s, at a time when it had a population of a couple million and was a poor third world state. North Korea is small, isolated, 
and nuclear armed. <laughs> it, it seems likely that most states could get nuclear weapons if they made the decision to do so. You know, people, uh, I see this a lot in the Iran debate, act as if nuclear weapons are some magical thing that are hard, hard to uh, develop. There are hurdles, of course. But the reality is that nuclear weapons are 1930s science and 1940s engineering, right? That's all you're asking a state to be able to do, is to, to function as well as, as a small group of Americans did in 1942. At Los Alamos, a computer was a human being with a slide rule. Today, if you have even the slightest idea what you're doing, you can go on Google and find specifications for weapons down to a tenth of a kilogram of required material. So what's the barrier here, really? The barrier is people choose not to do it. It's not technical. It's not, it's not financial. So that's very important to understand, and I think it's one of the misframings of the Iran picture. How far is Iran from a nuclear weapon? Every state on the planet is probably within two years of having a nuclear weapon. That's how long it took us to do uh, the, the weapons in World War II, when it had never been done before, when we didn't have the infrastructure, when there was no literature about how to do it, when no one on the planet had craft knowledge of building nuclear weapons. We did it in two years. Now, what didn't exist in, in the 1940s was all the mechanisms put in place to make it hard, right? <laughs> so that's what the NPT is really about is, on the denial side, is is putting in place barriers that make it slow and difficult to get nuclear weapons. But it, it, it's possible for just about any, any state. So why do states make this voluntary choice, right? And that's another thing I think gets lost in this picture, right? It's not that states have no right to have nuclear weapons and some states cheat and do it nevertheless. It's that every state has the right to defend itself however it wants, including nuclear weapons, and a large number of states have voluntarily chosen to give up the right to possess uh, nuclear weapons. Why do they make this choice? And then, as I touched on earlier, choosing to join and choosing to remain are two different things. But with the single exception of North Korea, every state that has joined the NPT system has remained within it. Despite all of these problems, despite all the complaints, despite all the criticisms, despite all the concerns about hypocrisy and discrimination, only North Korea has withdrawn from the treaty, even though it's very easy to withdraw from the NPT. So how are we to understand this puzzle? And I think that the answer is that there's a, a good argument against having nuclear weapons <laughs> that most states find persuasive. And the first plank of that argument is the limited utility of nuclear weapons. These devices are so destructive, they're so disproportionate to most uses and purposes to which they might be put that, one, that, there, that it's imaginable that you might use them only in certain very unlikely extreme cases. In addition, there's a question about whether these weapons are usable at all. You know, there's a, in the literature you've probably encountered in some of your studies over the past month, uh, there is this notion of a nuclear taboo. And the idea is, quite apart from the legalities of it, because the International Cr uh, Legal Court has, has already found in, 19, in the mid-1990s that nuclear use would be, in general, contrary to international humanitarian law. But beyond that, there's a moral repulsion at the thought that you would use these weapons to exterminate large numbers of, of human beings. There's a taboo that makes it very difficult to, to use them. For deterrence, perhaps, 
But deterrence is about threats. Use is something uh, totally different. You know, when Thomas Schelling was given the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, and gave his Nobel lecture, he, he talked about the nuclear taboo. And he said the most important and most extraordinary fact about the post-World War II era is that we have not used nuclear weapons again. Because what that shows is a normative barrier to the actual use of these weapons. There, there's an interesting example that's very close to home. In the early phases of the Korean War, the Allied forces got pushed back to the Pusan perimeter, almost thrown into the sea, tiny little corner of Korea, hanging on by our fingernails, a perimeter that had vulnerable spots that almost got ruptured. And we had essentially an operational nuclear monopoly at the time. The Russians had exploded a device but did not yet have deliverable nuclear weapons in their arsenal. The only precedent at that moment was not non-use but use. Yet we didn't use nuclear weapons. That was the beginning, I think, of the non-use tradition. It happened here on the Korean Peninsula. There's also a sense in which there's now a widespread norm of non-proliferation, not only a norm against use, but a norm against possession. And at least for some states, that may be a part of the answer of why they're reluctant to have nuclear weapons, because they were reluctant to violate this norm. Then there's the issue of costs. Uh, you know, basically to, to uh, choose not to have nuclear weapons, it's a judgment that the costs of having them exceed the benefits. Well, I've already suggested the benefits are somewhat limited because the utility is, is remote and, and the usability is questionable. But what are the costs? Well, there's a political diplomatic cost. What cost is Iran paid? <laughs> All right. Iraq, what cost did it pay? Right? When, you, when you get on the nuclear bad guys list, life turns out to be pretty unpleasant. Right? Uh, and then there's the economic cost. People are prone to say nuclear weapons are cheap. Well, that's certainly true if you're the, you're the United States and you spend $850 billion a year on defense. But if you're a small state, the cost of nuclear weapons have the opportunity cost that they limit your ability to have other kinds of power that would be more usable in the kinds of scenarios that are more likely to really confront your national decision makers. So there's an economic cost that I think is, is not inconsequential for some states. A very important potential cost is the problem of reciprocal acquisition. If we get nuclear weapons, our neighbors are likely to get nuclear weapons. Now we're living in a nuclear neighborhood. Does that feel good? Does that seem desirable? Is that going to be stable? Does that increase the likelihood that someone is going to use a nuclear weapon in anger? You know, so if you think about the case of Israel, Israel got nuclear weapons and it has fought a battle ever since to prevent its neighbors from getting nuclear weapons. And they've had to attack Iraq and they've had to attack Syria and they're considering attacking Iran, uh, which is still a problem for them. Egypt now is pursuing nuclear technology. That's likely to be a worry for Israel. The Saudis have uh, launched a nuclear uh, technology program and have said explicitly that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, uh, Saudi Arabia will get nuclear weapons. So Israel has so far succeeded in retaining its role as the only nuclear armed state in the Middle East, but at great cost to itself, with great pain and with considerable ongoing risk, and who knows how it will come out. But, so this idea of we can open the nuclear door in our neighborhood, but then we live in a nuclear neighborhood. For many states, that calculation doesn't look that, that uh, appealing. And then the last point I'd make is that, and it circles back to a point I made right at the beginning about US and Russia, and I have, I think, about 30 seconds left here, so I'll try to finish on this point. Uh, we have seen the NPT system essentially guarded by a set of great power enforcers. The United States and Russia have worked hard to restrain the spread of nuclear weapons. And we have tried to make the system work. We have tried to reinforce the penalties on bad guys. We have tried to strengthen the, the barriers to the spread of those sensitive, worrisome uh, technologies. Uh, and this has been true for the United States, even in relation to our allies. 
So as many of you will know better than I, the US and South Korea have had very difficult conversations and interactions over Korea's nuclear activities. Uh, with France, with Israel, with, uh, with Pakistan, uh, the United States has tried to be a guardian of the NPT system, even in relation to its friends and allies. And so if you're a state out there considering the acquisition of nuclear weapons or even the pursuit of nuclear weapons, you have to factor in as a potential cost that the great powers are not going to like this, that this is going to put you on some list that you're not going to want to be on, that there's likely to be sanctions or other penalties, that there's going to be diplomatic rifts and, and uh, ruptures, uh, and do you want to uh, pay that price in order to get weapons that you may not be able to use and that may not be relevant to most of your, your genuine security concerns. So let me close by suggesting that, that maybe the, the key to the uh, NPT systems resilience is that the acquisition of nuclear weapons for most states is a high cost, low benefit option. And the overwhelming majority of states in the system have decided it's not worth it. And they'd rather be in the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state and be operating in a context in which they can voice constraint complaints and have some influence uh, rather than live in Albert Wolstetter's life in a nuclear armed crowd. And so for all the troubles that I started out describing right at the beginning of my talk about the context for the current NPT review uh, conference, you could say that the NPT today is in a, in a somewhat normal state, which is to say it's imperfect but invaluable, it's troubled but it's durable. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Miller, for your very insightful, far-reaching comments on the status of global nuclear non-proliferation. I would uh, entertain maybe one or two questions, or any comments to the opening keynote speech. There's a couple back there. Okay. So Aman from India, and then I see Kelvin from USA raising their hand. Yes. Uh, hello. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, what do you think would be an ideal way for the disarmament? Thank you. Perhaps we can go also with Karin's question. Yes, go ahead. Use the microphone, please. So Aman is from University of Delhi. Ah, so fellow Karin is a student in grand jury from University of Florida. Yeah. Ah, very good. Yeah. Uh, so my question relates to the nuclear taboo. So. Uh, We've seen research as part of the NARIC program that suggests that uh, nuclear, people that live in nuclear powers have a more hawkish view on the use. Uh, however, uh, how about the rest of the world? Uh, I haven't, like, do you know of any research about the views of uh, nuclear aspiring countries on uh, nuclear weapons? Or on, on, rather, the people's perspective on the use of nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. We have one more here. Oh, okay. So Ajo from Ghana. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, please, when you are talking about the, the TPNW, you made mention of um, ban. So I would like to know, uh, uh, um, when you talk of um, ban, does that include um, having the nuclear weapon or using it or both? Uh, because in some cases, some countries might um, have the nuclear weapon, but then they wouldn't have any intention of using it. They just want to have it for, for I don't know, like for security sake or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. On the disarmament question, I think the, uh, the proper way to think about that is trajectory. What trajectory are we on? Uh, no one expects 
that it will happen or would have happened in any circumstances quickly. But from 1945 to 1986, the number of nuclear weapons went like this in a linear fashion. Every year, more weapons, more weapons, more weapons. And not a few weapons, huge numbers of weapons. By the time the holdings of the United States and the Soviet Union reached their combined peak in 1986, I believe it was, uh, there were in round numbers approximately 80,000 nuclear weapons on this planet in the arsenals just of those two powers. But that was 98 percent of the weapons on the planet. Every one of those weapons, or the overwhelming majority of them, were many times more powerful than the weapons that were used in Japan in 1945. And some of them orders of magnitude more destructive. So very difficult to make the argument that you're respecting your Article 6 obligations and that you're working in good faith which is the language of Article 6, working in good faith toward nuclear disarmament, when you're engaged in the most ghastly arms race in human history. Now, as the era of arms control began to accumulate, the agreements were used to bring those numbers down. So then now you can say, we're moving in the right direction, we're putting in place restraints, we're negotiating agreements that constrain the abilities of the two sides to engage in these all-out all arms racing. And then in 1991, the Soviet Union fell apart. And we were dealing with a completely new geopolitical reality, one in which uh, President George H.W. Bush proclaimed both a new world order and a strategic partnership with Moscow. And the idea was, now we have harmony among the big powers, now we have an ability to cooperate very deeply and extensively. Now we have a shared interest in minimizing the inadvertent, the accidental risks associated with having all these nuclear weapons around. And sure enough, the numbers came down much, much further. And at that point, you could say, well, the, there's still too many nuclear weapons and uh, we're still not that close to nuclear disarmament, but the trajectory is like this. And the political relationship was such that you could imagine more progress in the future. All of that ended around 2000. Just to choose a round number, uh, I personally date the, what I call the turning of the tide to the defeat in the U.S. Senate of the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in 1998, I believe it was. Uh, and since then, what we've seen is a retreat from arms control. What we've seen since then is a, is a return to what you might call nuclear-focused uh, strategic doctrines. Uh, and then, as I mentioned in the recent years, uh, the rediscovery of modernization. And now, you, if you look, you'll see there's a modest literature out there claiming that we're back in a big arms race. This time, it's a three-way arms race because China matters too. Uh, and meanwhile, one of the huge differences between the world of 1991 and the world of 2022 is that we have two regional nuclear balances. So India and Pakistan are both uh, very substantially modernizing their programs. They're gradually developing what you might call a, an American-style triad. Uh, they're uh, accumulating larger numbers of weapons, although it's in the hundreds rather than the thousands, as with the U.S. and Russia. And of course, in Northeast Asia, we have, in some ways, the most nuclearized region in the world, pivoting on North Korea's uh, nuclear capabilities. But we have the intersection of Russia, China, the United States, and North Korea, so four nuclear armed states, and two nuclear protected states, Korea and Japan, who are part of the American alliance system. So that's a, that particular regional dynamic is heavily nuclearized. Right? That didn't exist in 1991. The South Asian nuclear balance didn't exist in 1991. And then what you have is the intersection of what you might call these multiple uh, nuclear orders. All right? So China, in some ways, is the central pivot <laughs> because it's connected to the, Soviet, to the Russian-American 
nuclear relationship. It's deeply connected to the Northeast Asian nuclear relationship, but, the, but it's also deeply connected to the South Asian picture because India and China are rivals. China and Pakistan have a close relationship. So you have reverberations through the entire system because of the interconnectedness of these nuclear balances. So you see the world growing more nuclearized and the nuclear orders becoming more complex rather than moving in the direction of smaller numbers, more constraints, better and, and more ambitious agreements. So that's how I, would, how I would think about it. And the goal I would think would be over the long haul to reconstruct an arms control architecture that imposed very substantial constraints on deployed nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think the world would be happy with that, but it's a long way from where we are. Uh, on the nuclear taboo, uh, our speaker in the next session, Scott Sagan, has done some very important work, experimental work, on how strong is the nuclear taboo. And to the dismay of people who believe in the taboo, uh, he's found that uh, Americans, at least, are surprisingly willing to use nuclear weapons under certain hypothetical scenarios, basically to save American lives in conflict situations. Uh, the public would be prepared to support uh, nuclear use. So that provoked a huge debate and there's been counter uh, work done to try and refute uh, uh, Sagan and his colleagues. Uh, but um, the taboo is an attitude. It's, it's normative. It's not anything tangible or real that you can, that you can describe and, <laughs> and see. So it's very hard to assess. Is it real? There's been a debate for a long time. Is there really a nuclear taboo? Uh, if real, how powerful is it? Uh, and it, it may be, uh, you know, for a long time it was said that there was a non-proliferation taboo, that is on the spread of nuclear weapons. And then India and Pakistan got nuclear weapons. So was there still a taboo? How many exceptions does a taboo allow? But at any rate, what we do know is that whatever taboo it, it exists. It's not impermeable. It's not perfect. It, 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 it exists only until someone has a different attitude. <laughs> so that's the big worry and that's why we, we are always concerned about, for example, even in the case of the Ukraine war, there were uh, instances in which uh, Putin made nuclear allusions that, that caused people in the U.S. To, to be very upset about the potential that nuclear weapons might be used in this war. Uh, on the TPNW, it's a complete ban on the possession of nuclear weapons. And it's uh, meant to be universal, so no exceptions, no, no legal acknowledgement that some people have a right to have nuclear weapons. And the argument really is that this is superior to the NPT precisely because it's a clear, simple, unambiguous ban that has no discriminatory or, or hypocritical components to it. Uh, and uh, it, it has, uh, it was supported by 122 states and the UN General Assembly. It had a, an entry into force provi provision that required 50 ratifications. The ratifications, the sufficient number of ratifications have been achieved. And so the very first review conference of the TPNW took place earlier, just earlier this summer. Uh, and there is, again, a, a normative argument that basically says the nuclear weapon states, no matter how much they protest and reject the TPNW, will find themselves under normative pressure by the weight of world opinion. Most of the international system objects to the possession of these weapons and has been prepared to join a legal instrument, a legally binding instrument, that makes it unlawful to have nuclear weapons. And the idea is that you can create an environment in which possessing nuclear weapons is so objectionable that even the nuclear weapon states uh, will feel the pressure to, to respond, uh, even though they're obviously very reluctant in the current environment to uh, give any weight whatsoever to the TPNW. I think we are running already late, so. My fault. <laughs> Sorry. We should wrap this, wrap this session up, but uh, very grateful to Professor Miller for his very insightful comments. And uh, we're excited to have the follow-on discussions on a number of issues. But first, let's thank our speaker.
and close the session. At this point, I'd like to encourage everybody to come out. We're going to have a photo session before we move on to the next one. Hope that was good. for cleaner and healthier energy that the world wants. KHNP is growing with the world. A global energy company. Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power. KHNP is South Korea's largest energy company. From the first. To the greatest. And the best. The early challenges KHNP took on were the first steps forward to producing better energy and have now become great steps in the history of energy production. KHNP is a total energy company. Korea's largest power generation company produces one quarter of the domestic electric power with renewable energy such as nuclear power, hydropower, pumped storage power, solar PV, wind power, and fuel cells. KHNP has become the foundation for South Korea's economic development, enriching our lives through stable power supply. KHNP is a global energy company. A company replete with solid corporate assets, an excellent talent pool, and global recognition. By distributing advanced technology to various points around the world in need of electricity, from power plant construction to operation solutions, KHNP is positioned to become the world's leading energy company. KHNP is the leader of the future energy industry, enriching life with eco-friendly energy. KHNP continuously invests in new and renewable energy and R&D. By achieving technological innovations through integration with the fourth industrial revolution, expanding its overseas business and new energy business, KHNP is preparing for a new future. KHNP pursues social values. As a leading company in the energy industry, KHNP paves the way for shared growth through collaboration and win-win growth. As a contributing member of the local community, KHNP actively provides generous support for and takes the initiative in developing the local economy, improving the living environment, and revitalizing the local culture. As a global energy leader, KHNP also strives to fulfill its roles and responsibilities abroad beyond Korea. A total energy company that grows bigger through change and innovation company that constantly challenges itself for a better tomorrow. KHNP is leading the global energy industry. A trusted global energy leader. Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power.
So, dear participants, we'll be starting our next session in one minute. always <laughs> Shall we begin? I heard uh, Stephen Miller's uh, lecture very interesting, and uh, I discovered the new meaning of uh, MPT. Uh, what does MPT stand for after hearing his lecture? N is nevertheless. P is promising, and T is treaty. So, nevertheless. Promising treaty is MPT. And uh, let me go into the first panel. Uh, in, in this panel, we will deal with the uh, Russo-Ukraine war and its implications on global nuclear governance. The first uh, uh, keynote speaker is uh, Scott Sagan from Stanford University. Uh, he will, uh, he waited so long, and I'll give you mic to Dr. Scott Sagan. Well, thank you. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay, let me make sure I'm sharing my screen properly. And can you all see my screen? Perfectly. OK, well, let me start just by saying I regret that I'm not able to join you in, in person today. Um, it, it is unfortunate. Uh, and I am jealous uh, that Professor Yim and Dr. Miller and many of you are there together. 
Uh, I wish I could be uh, there with you. Uh, I would greatly uh, prefer that. Um, I want to make sure that I've got the, the full screen up. I think this would be okay. So I, I'm going to tee up uh, my other distinguished colleagues who will be speaking to you today um, just by talking a, a bit about my views on whether nuclear weapons are part of the cause of the war in Ukraine, um, how they've influenced the, the conduct of the war, and what are the consequences uh, of the war um, and the nuclear dimension of that. I'll take a few questions, but then I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, my colleagues for, for further um, comments and, and questions. I need to share the screen properly. So first, I, I want to say that um, there was a, a, a very good piece by Snyder called Nuclear Nukes, Nazis, and NATO that basically, um, I think, has, has strongly um, uh, demonstrated that the claims that Vladimir Putin made um, about um, the causes of the Ukraine war were fabricated. They were her, his efforts to create opposition to intervention and to create popular views at home that would support him from his aggressive acts. The idea that um, nuclear weapons were part of what caused this, that the United States uh, and, um, and, and Ukraine were involved in building their own nuclear weapons in Ukraine, that Lavrov and the quote here from 1st March just has been totally fabricated. There's no evidence for that. Um, when this became less plausible, the Russians started talking about biological weapons programs jointly with the US and Ukraine. And again, there's no evidence that that was the case. There were certainly um, bio defense programs, but no bio offensive weapons programs. The idea that there were Nazis in the um, Ukraine regime is again totally fabricated. The idea that 70% of the Ukrainian vote went for a Jewish president should be just a strong piece of evidence that the idea that there was a Nazi at the head of the regime is, is um, a fabricated argument. There were certainly some very far right um, militia and other groups in Ukraine, uh, but they were not part of the central government nor, nor um, at the heart of the central government. And the idea that NATO expansion was the heart, there's no doubt that the Russians did not like the expansion of NATO, but they stood um, and accepted the expansion of NATO elsewhere and Ukraine was not about to become a, a member of NATO. It was on a long range trajectory path and everything that this war has created has meant two other countries have joined NATO and Ukraine is much more likely in the future. What did create the actual causes? I would say three things. Um, one is that as this photograph so well symbolizes um, in a personalist dictatorship where an individual has sole power and, and surrounds himself with yes men, the idea that you would get uh, contradictory information that someone would tell you that you're wrong or would push back against you is extremely reduced. Uh, Putin is caught on film, not just in this um, 
symbolic uh, effort to be on the opposite side of a table, uh, but uh, insulting and berating his head of, uh, uh, of intelligence services for not supporting him adequately. This is what happens when you have a personal dictator who uh, no one is willing to give contradictory uh, evidence and have checks and balances. Um, I strongly support the ideas of um, my colleague Catherine Stoner, who argues that um, what was threatening about Ukraine was less its military capabilities, but its burgeoning democracy and success. And what is threatening to, or what was threatening to the Putin regime was to have a neighbor with similar cultural background and similar history until the end of the, of the Soviet Union, suddenly become vibrant and become a democracy. And that was threatening to his regime at home because as its people saw what could happen with Ukraine, this was a threat to his regime stability. And lastly, saber rattling and his nuclear threats were what I would call not a cause, but maybe an enabling cause. It was something that permitted him to at least think that he might get the West to um, not um, be as involved. Um, and therefore, some of the threats that he made were an effort to try to get NATO and the US not to uh, get involved in the conflict, and it partially worked. Uh, you know, Biden very quickly decided not to send U.S. troops and very quickly um, said that uh, he would not support a, a no-fly zone. But it didn't work in the um, desire of, of Putin to stop support for Ukraine. And there have been millions of dollars, obviously, hundreds of millions of dollars given to Ukraine and a proxy war in which the U.S. and NATO is supporting Ukraine while not getting directly involved, although quite deeply indirectly involved or, or involved in terms of intelligence and military capabilities. Uh, in terms of conduct, I think the key question we need to address is what should NATO do if there is nuclear weapons use? And I have a clear and simple answer. It depends. It depends on whether there's a, what kind of use. If it's a demonstration strike, my own view is that the United States and NATO should ignore it and condemn it, but not condemn it, not ignore it. Condemn it, but ignore it in terms of military responses. Um, if there is a military target that is attacked, that depends on how important the military target is and that we should consider the constraints that we have thus far had um, in terms of not sending uh, U.S. troops, not giving direct involvement, we should reconsider those and potentially attack, uh, get involved directly, uh, attack Russian uh, forces in Ukraine, and potentially attack Russian forces in uh, uh, naval forces uh, uh, south of Ukraine, and potentially even attack forces inside. But the key issue here is that we should not um, escalate in terms of nuclear use, but consider using conventional weapons to attack the forces that are involved here. And if there's an attack against a um, civilian city, a, an effort to try to uh, end the war the way we did in 1945 through a terrorist attack against the city, we should condemn that we should not respond in kind, but respond forcefully, militarily against Russia. And my own view is here, um, it is very important to um, take into account um, what the long range goals are. And our goals should here be not to um, try to um, escalate the conflict, but to um, respond firmly, but in a way that is de-escalatory. And secondly, we should try to deter that use now. 
by telling the Russians that any use of nuclear weapons will be responded to forcefully and any use against civilian targets will be a war, war, a war crime and any military officer who follows the president uh, in um, or follows Putin in executing something will be subject to war crime tribunals. Uh, what does this mean for the future? Well, my own view is that um, North Korea is far less likely to disarm, given what's happened and given the invasion of uh, Ukraine by, um, by Russia, and that we need to rethink what this means about Iran and its neighbors, because I think the idea that we're going to be able to convince them that we won't attack them is less likely. Uh, I know that others want to still consider um, the kind of guarantees we might make, and it's worth considering them and worth trying to pursue them. But this current attack makes this harder and more challenging. So I, I look forward to um, our conversation this evening. We're in a deep, deep military conflict that has made um, this a second Cold War and that we need to rethink what this means, not just about nuclear stability and crisis management, but also for the future of nonproliferation. And I thank um, Narek for opening up this conversation and very much look forward to our discussion this evening. Thank you. Thank you. You gave us more minutes to talk about uh, and do you have any question to Dr. Sagan? Yes, over there. Mike. Hello, sorry. All right, so I'm Kevin Goss. Uh, so my question is, would it be possible to make an international procedure to handle nuclear emergencies without, within conflict zones? Uh, because in the past, right, you, we've had those sort of agreements like 1914, the, the Christmas uh, armistice, uh, but also Russia historically has had, uh, the way they, they handle invasions is that they destroy the land as they, go, as they retreat. So that way, uh, armies like an Napoleon invasion couldn't uh, continue, right? So similarly, they could employ a strategy where they uh, cause a emer nuclear emergency and then retreat, if if that was the case. So um, yeah, would it be possible to make that type of uh, procedure? Thank you. It's a really interesting question. Um, I would note first off that the Christmas Armistice of 1914 was not an agreement. Um, it was not a treaty. It was not negotiated by a higher level. It was a, a, a um, on the ground level um, decision by local forces. Let's just not keep fighting, and 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 create a, a zone um, of, of armistice for this particular day. And that may well be the case in some cases that local fighters will decide for the sake of humanity towards each other to, to stop fighting. So I don't rule that out. It's a, it's a, it's a promising note, but it's not a, um, a government policy and nor can it be negotiated. Um, what I find so disturbing about this war um, in Ukraine is, is that um, the Russians have not just um, violated the um, UN Charter by attacking in, an aggressive, in a war of aggression um, Ukraine, that it's that they have also um, increasingly given evidence that they're violating the laws of armed, armed conflict in the way that they're fighting. 
And I should note here that there's a false equivalence that some countries or some speakers have given. Well, they say, well, you know, the, the U.S. had war crimes in Afghanistan. We had war crimes in Iraq, and the New York Times won a Pulitzer for their reporting on uh, attacking of civilians in, in ISIS-controlled uh, Syria. And the difference here is important. There are violations of the laws of armed conflict in all wars. What we saw in Afghanistan and Iraq is that when the United States did this, the U.S. government arrested and put on trial and if deemed guilty, put in prison the individuals who committed war crimes during those conflicts. The difference is that in Ukraine today, Putin has not just permitted such war crimes to exist, but he was actually um, promoted or um, given promotion to the units that have been involved in rape and pillage and murder. So the Russians are using um, violations of the laws of armed conflict as a way to intimidate the Ukrainians. And it hasn't worked thus far, but it's been deeply tragic and um, and should be uh, called out for all the attention it deserves. Do you have any okay? Thank you very much, Professor Sagan. My question is, uh, would you be able to elaborate on the assertive methods that the West could utilize to deter and discourage Russia from ever considering to use nuclear weapons in the Russo-Ukrainian conflict? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, here I have only limited insights, um, and it's partly because you know, Putin is, has been making decisions on his own, and that's, that's part of the disturbing aspect that we're facing today. Um, I think it is important um, for us to, uh, to tell the Russian military um, quietly if we have contacts with them and publicly uh, in a more general sense that the United States has a long history of going after war criminals. And any attack against a civilian target would be a war crime. And that's not a strong deterrent, but it is still helpful. Um, I think we should discourage Putin by saying that we'd respond. But the trick here is not to commit ourselves to what I've called the commitment trap. To not say, oh, for the sake of deterrence, we should like give a really bold statement that we'd respond in kind and, and, uh, and we'd use nuclear weapons. The problem of doing that is that if it fails, then you're sort of caught in a, in a trap that for the sake of your, your honor or your future credibility or your domestic political credibility, a president might feel that he or in the future she might have to respond in ways that don't make sense or, or won't be reasonable. So I like the, night, um, the Obama administration's nuclear posture review that said with respect to biological weapons, that anyone who uses them against us, we will respond with conventional capabilities that will be devastating and will make sure that anyone, not just the leader who chooses to do that, but anyone who execute it will be held fully accountable. I think that kind of general statement would help deter. How much, I don't know, um, but I do think that, that it is helpful to think about this ahead of time. Professor Egan, uh, I have a question for you. And in your classic book of uh, nuclear non-proliferation, spread of nuclear weapons, 
you said some kind of biblical saying that more will be worse. Do you still believe that and how can you uh, persuade others to believe this? Um, well, thank you. The book that you're referring to was written with Ken Waltz who wrote a famous article saying that more will be better. And um, my own view is that more countries getting nuclear weapons increases the risk that they will be used. And what's particularly disturbing is that um, not all nuclear states are alike in their decision-making process. And what's particularly worrisome is when countries that are run by personalist dictators acquire the bomb, where a decision maker makes decisions based on his own whims, where someone surrounds himself with yes men who will say yes, no one will respond, we'll be able to take over the country quickly, don't worry about it, which is, I think, what happened with Putin, um, where, where no one will tell the dictator that your assumptions are wrong. And that's what happened, for example, with Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait. So I think that um, the spread of nuclear weapons is dangerous always, but it's particularly dangerous when personalist dictators acquire the bomb. Um, and that suggests to me that North Korea is very worrisome today. So I, I, I'm very interested in people's views in this meeting about how South Korea should respond. I hope by maintaining the U.S. alliance and not acquiring your own weapons, because I think that creates other kinds of problems. But I'm also really worried about what happens next with Iran and Saudi Arabia, because those countries do not have checks and balances on their decision making. And it's important, deterrence does not require pristine rationality. It requires that decision makers who are not perfectly rational have checks and balances on them so somebody can say, sir, that, that information's wrong. Sir, that's not the right way of thinking about this. And so we need to have democracies with um, with checks and balances making decisions, not personalist dictatorships. Thank you. Uh, with this, uh, uh, let us uh, give him big applause to Dr. Sagan. Thank you. We will start uh, other speakers. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Francesca Giovanni from Harvard University uh, Welfare Center. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Well, Good evening from Boston and good morning to everyone who is sitting in the audience. I really want to thank, like Scott has done, uh, Mansung Him and the NEREC staff for this invitation. I have been used to come to South Korea in August. It's an invitation I always treasure. And so I, I hope to be invited again next year, maybe in person. So I've been asked to add my two cents uh, uh, to uh, what Scott has said about the Ukraine, um, uh, with the Ukraine war and somehow the impact that the Ukraine war is having or might have on the uh, global nuclear order. And I just want to caution uh, all of us in uh, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, drawing reflections and conclusions on the Ukraine war for two reasons. Wars are inevitably complicated issues. They are very dynamic. We are still in the middle of it. So being able to draw really, you know, conclusions or, you know, assertions might be a very dangerous and precarious exercise. Um, 
But I also think that there is a second reason why it is so difficult to make sense of the Ukraine war. It's fundamentally because many of the guidance principles that we have that go back to the Cuba Missile Crisis and the Cold War might not be applicable to the current nuclear age we are living in. And I want to begin actually citing uh, former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, who was cited in an excellent article by Eric Schlosser together with Scott Sagan on The Atlantic. And Secretary Perry made the following observation. He said the risk of a full-scale nuclear war were much higher, higher during the Cold War. The odds of a nuclear weapon use, however, are higher today. And in my view, his statement really reflects both the unprecedented period we are living in, right, where we have very little guidance on how to navigate and interpret what we are living, and also the contradictions of this global nuclear age. Now, to be clear, nuclear instability didn't start with the Ukraine war. And in a certain sense, you can say that the Ukraine war was fundamentally a symptom of a much deeper and much larger problem. As Steve Miller has uh, illustrated, uh, we have come from a number of years of instability, unpredictability, uh, the unraveling of the arms control architecture, uh, a series of proliferation crises, our inability to put on the table incentives for North Korea and now for Iran to uh, you know, halt their nuclear ambitions, the decoupling between the US and China when it comes to technology, for example. So all these things that started way before the Ukraine war. But I think what's surprised about the Ukraine war is that our predictions about nuclear crisis and the potential use of a nuclear weapon was actually elsewhere, but not in Europe. If you look at many of the scenarios and studies we have done over the years, the classical scenario was about India and Pakistan or Northeast Asia. No one would have imagined that today, at the heart of Europe, we are thinking and talking about the potential use of nuclear weapons. So as you can see, the scenarios we worked with somehow do not reflect many of the dynamics that we have not been able to capture. Now, I have written at the very beginning of the war that uh, there could be a possibility for Russia to use tactical nuclear weapons. And I want to underline that I think is an unlikely case, but it is not implausible. And in my view, there are three reasons that make the scenario unlikely, but not impossible. The first one is the stakes that are in this war. Now, on February 23rd, Putin has said very clearly that this is a country that he cannot lose. In fact, he actually considered Ukraine not even a country in and of itself. He called it the cradle of the Russian culture. And that means this is a country that he cannot lose to someone else. The second is the incredible conventional inferiority that the Russians have shown on the ground. Now, we are seeing that the war has moved in the southern part of the country. That makes maybe the use of tactical nuclear weapons less likely because, as Scott has said on the Atlantic piece, this is a territory the Russians want to keep. But that does not necessarily exclude the need, possibly, for the Russians at some point to have to supply their conventional inferiority with the use of potential nuclear weapons. And finally, as exactly as Scott said, what also made, in my view, the potential of a nuclear weapon use more plausible is the incredible isolation of President Putin in his decision making. So we actually don't know who he's listening to. We don't know what kind of information he's, he's uh, subjected to. But what we have seen before the war is their inability and, in fact, fear of his own uh, you know, leaders and commanders to actually confront him. So we can imagine a leader that is completely isolated in, in his nuclear decision making. That makes the situation very unpredictable. Now, I want to just uh, point out a couple of uh, things that I think, independently from whether the Ukraine war will end up in a use of a nuclear weapon or not, I think the, the, the Ukraine war has fundamentally uh, affected two major relations. One, I would say, is the nuclear deterrence relation among nuclear weapon states. And the second one, which I care deeply about, in fact, I probably care more about the second one, is about the relation between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon state. So let me finish by offering a couple of thoughts on both relationships. I think the nuclear deterrence, uh, nuclear deterrence is now, uh, you know, calling to question, or at least uh, in a way, um, 
you know, uh, strained by the Ukraine war for a couple of reasons. One, as Joe Nye recently said, the Ukraine war demonstrates that nuclear deterrence works, but what matters in making nuclear deterrence work is not the capabilities you have, is the stakes that you hold in a crisis. This means even if you are a smaller nuclear weapon state, but you have higher vital stakes in a crisis, you can still actually uh, win or overcome. This also makes it really problematic, uh, if this is the case, for nuclear extended deterrence to remain credible. Because if the vital stakes is really what guide nuclear deterrence moving forward, it will be very difficult for a nuclear guarantor to prove that he has vital stakes in Asia or in Europe that would might lead uh, you know, the United States into a nuclear crisis. So the vital stakes more than the capabilities are what matters. But I feel that especially in, in the nuclear scholarship, we have put too much attention on delivery system modernization, and we have not actually focused enough on the actual stakes that countries have in specific countries. The second element, in my view, that makes really nuclear deterrence uh, interesting today is that the war in Ukraine is a conventional war. But what we are seeing here is in a proxy war between the United States and Russia, what is happening today is that both countries need to restrain their conventional capabilities and their attacks to avoid end up into a nuclear escalation ladder. So conventional war management will become increasingly important in the future. At the same time, in my view, the Ukraine war has also revealed that rather the in inutility of some fancy and very sexy technologies. Where are the hypersonic, for example? Where is the cyber weapons? Why were they used? Or in some cases, they were used, but with very little utility. So I think, I think this Ukraine war shows some very interesting things about the conventional war management that maybe we haven't, we haven't thought about. And then the final point on the deterrent side is that information uh, warfare is becoming increasingly important. And as you have, you have seen uh, in, in the propaganda machine of the Russians, but also the propaganda machine that maybe we are listening to, we see and understand this war in completely different terms. So information will become really important in the deterrence uh, relations moving forward. I want to finish with a comment about nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. I did write a, a recent piece in the arms control uh, journal on uh, uh, the question of negative security assurances. And I, wa I, I wanted to do this because to me, the Ukraine war is read in a very dramatic way in Europe and in the United States, but it must be really dramatic and almost shocking if you see it from the lenses of a non-nuclear weapon state that it actually has no protection, is under no nuclear umbrella, he has no nuclear capabilities. So a world like this, in the Ukraine war for a non-nuclear weapon state might looks like a complete anarchy. But a nuclear anarchy where nuclear weapon states are increasingly becoming predatory. So where does protection lie in a world like this? Where do non-nuclear weapon states receive the protection they need and the guarantees that they will not be attacked and destroyed with, by, by a nuclear weapon? Now, in Washington, there is a debate today that says the Ukraine war will lead to two things. One, it will lead to a new proliferation cascade. Many, many non-nuclear weapon states will uh, finally run to acquire the nuclear capabilities. I think Steve Miller has done a fantastic job in explaining that this is a very simplistic argument for many, many reasons. Or, as David Albright has said, non-nuclear weapon states will run to ask for the nuclear umbrella, nuclear guarantees by the United States and other countries. But that's not so obvious the United States will want to extend guarantees over other countries in the, in the near future. So my argument is this is not the time where we need to back down from protecting all the countries that have actually committed to nuclear non-proliferation. This is not the time just to say, well, unfortunately, this is nuclear anarchy, you are on your own. And my argument has been very clear to say that negative security assurances, so the promise that if you are a non-nuclear weapon state, you are not going to be attacked with nuclear weapons, need to be reinforced. And I make, and I want to conclude with this, I make three suggestions very clearly. The first one, it is time for the UN Security Council veto power 
to be finally connected to nuclear responsibility behaviors. We can't continue to say that the UN Security Council member states are the guarantors of the world order, and then you have these guarantors that go around and threaten countries with the use of nuclear weapons. So nuclear responsibility has to be attached to the veto power of the UN Security Council. My second suggestion is it is time for the UN General Assembly to become more than just an assembly. And it needs to play a very clear political role in making sure the nuclear weapons possessing states, so not only the, the UN Security Council, but all nuclear weapon states, become accountable to the international community. There is on the table a proposal by the Swedish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs that is asking nuclear possessing countries to report to the UN General Assembly on an annual basis on any change in their nuclear posture, force or structure. And finally, the last point, I believe non-nuclear weapon states need to take bold actions to demand protection in a world that is populated by uh, predatory nuclear weapon states. And one possibility will be for non-nuclear weapon states to demand that every single economic agreement they sign with nuclear weapon possessing countries is also, also includes security guarantees that have to be negative, universal, non-conditional and permanent. I think this is a way in which the international community can really say we are hearing the concerns of the international community and we want to do something about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. After hearing other presentation and then discuss, right? The next, next speaker is uh, Tong Chao from Princeton University. You are based in China now? Um, I was based in China, but I recently uh, joined Princeton University's program on science and global security, and I will be here for one year oh. as a visiting researcher. And after that, I will return to Beijing. Oh, glad to see you again. Uh, we, we saw in Beijing very, very often, but uh, you are in the United States. You are free to talk now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> anyway, uh, please. You know, as long as um, I need to go back to China, as long as I have family members and friends in China, I will always have to speak uh, with uh, as much carefulness as possible. <laughs> um, but uh, let's address today's uh topic about the impact of Ukraine war on uh, global nuclear governments. I will make a few uh, points. Uh, a lot of great points have already been made. Um, I think, uh, for one, uh, Russia's nuclear cyber rattling during the Ukraine war promotes the notion that nuclear weapons can play an important role in defending national interests, including in non-nuclear scenarios. Um, I think a number of countries, including China, uh, are very sympathetic to Russia's, uh, Russian now and Russia's narratives uh, of, of why it needs to invade uh, Ukraine. Uh, and these countries uh, genuinely believe that uh, Russia is simply defending its legitimate security interests. And therefore, the Russian efforts to raise the significance of nuclear weapons to conduct nuclear cyber rattling did not receive very strong pushback from these countries. And that works to legitimize, to some extent, such nuclear cyber rattling behaviors. Um, and from the Chinese perspective, and maybe uh, this is true to some other countries as well, the Russian nuclear, uh, nuclear cyber rattling actually worked. Um, it helped uh, achieve its intended goal of deterring direct NATO military intervention and discouraging NATO countries from imposing 
much stronger military, uh, uh, much stronger economic sanctions uh, on uh, Russia, and uh, providing much uh, stronger military support to Ukraine. Uh, so the effect of Russian nuclear uh, cyber rattling is recognized in countries like China. Um, and the way that Russia practices nuclear uh, signaling during the Ukraine war also indicates to many observers uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, other nuclear weapon states that a nuclear weapon state doesn't really need to issue explicit threat of nuclear use in order to achieve the goal of deterrence and dissuasion um, at the political, uh, economic, and conventional military levels. Uh, rather, um, uh, the country can uh, issue implicit uh, nuclear threats by conducting uh, nuclear exercises uh, with nuclear weapon systems by conducting tests of nuclear uh, capable weapon uh, systems, uh, by uh, broadcasting the movements of nuclear missile units, or by simply showing off one's nuclear briefcase, by right? the so-called uh, you know, nuclear briefcase, um, uh, which is uh, the uh, presidential device that uh, can be used to issue nuclear orders. Um, and all, all of these uh, implicit uh, nuclear signaling uh, measures uh, already work uh, to uh, 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 deter and dissuade the enemy's uh, military activities. Um, so I think uh, countries like China, uh, they recognize that they don't really need to uh, to explicit threaten nuclear use in a conventional war. Uh, they can engage in uh, uh, so-called smart or clever uh, nuclear signaling practice uh, to, achieve, to achieve their intended military uh, 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 objective. Uh, and I think this uh, interpretation could also legitimize the threat of the use of nuclear weapons, even though it wouldn't do much uh, to uh, to uh, legitimize the actual use of nuclear weapons. Um, and it could also make reassurance measures such as no first use policy less relevant in future military conflicts. Um, a second point uh, is already mentioned by uh, our previous speakers, which is about the impact of this information, um, which is really serious, uh, not only uh, in Russia, but also in other countries. Um, for example, you know, uh, Professor Sega mentioned uh, Russians' uh, narrative about uh, American bio labs in Ukraine and other countries. And uh, in China, uh, the majority of Chinese experts, including uh, experts who work on policies of weapons of mass destruction, genuinely believe that the United States has been conducting illegal biological weapon research at these bio labs. Um, uh, Russia also spread this information about uh, Ukraine's development of uh, military nuclear capabilities. Um, uh, so as, as a result of these uh, false claims, uh, countries like China have, um, you know, developed even less trust about uh, Western countries. Many Chinese officials and experts are blaming Western countries for spreading this information. Uh, and this affects uh, these countries' understandings and interpretations of, of other related issues. Uh, for example, uh, Western countries have criticized Russia 
for conducting uh, military operations near civilian uh, nuclear facilities in Ukraine. Uh, even today, I think uh, there there is report that Russian forces are can you know uh, 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 launching uh, conventional military attacks from places very near uh, uh, nuclear power plants. Um, so from the Western countries' perspective, these are irresponsible behaviors. They could endanger civilian nuclear uh, facilities. But in China, many uh, nuclear experts are blaming the Western countries for spreading disinformation and for uh, demonizing uh, Russia because they don't believe uh, Russia has indeed been uh, conducting such uh, activities, military activities near uh, Ukraine uh, nuclear power facilities. Um, this undermines the overall trust among the major powers uh, on important issues like nuclear safety and security. It makes some countries believe that, uh, you know, nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear safety and security diplomacy is, you know, is all political games. Uh, Western countries are very uh, hypocritical uh, in upholding their uh, blamed uh, principles in the nuclear domain. I think this very cynical interpretation uh, of international non-proliferation and safety security principles uh, would uh, undermine future major power cooperation on issues like uh, AUKUS or, uh, uh, or uh, you know, controlling uh, Iran or North Korea's uh, nuclear development. Um, the last point I want to make uh, before uh, finishing up is um, in, in some sense, uh, the Ukraine war might make the international community become more determined to prevent additional proliferation uh, because it demonstrates to the world that once a country acquires nuclear weapons, once it acquires nuclear deterrent, uh, it would be very hard uh, to impose uh, uh, you know, lethal uh, uh, economic, some, you know, crippling, uh, crippling economic sanctions or to, uh, uh, you know, or basically to impose real threat uh, to the country. Uh, if if, if uh, external pressure uh, makes the country really fear about its security, it could uh, result to uh, uh, threatening nuclear weapons use. Um, so I think this would strengthen international determination uh, to prevent additional nuclear uh, proliferation activities. Um, but uh, on the other hand, um, it is also true that the greater uh, political distrust as a result of the Ukraine war is going to make uh, major power cooperation uh, in this regard, harder to take place. As I said, um, the distrust is going to undermine international cooperation on issues like uh, Iran or North Korea's nuclear ambition. Um, I have some other points, but I think I'm already talking for too long, so I will stop here and look forward uh, to uh, the, the other speakers' uh, insight and to look forward to comments and uh, questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Let me introduce uh, last speaker, uh, Dr. Bong Wenjun. He is uh, vice president of the Korea Nuclear Policy Society for 10 years. He is not still promoted to president. <laughs> anyway, anyway, he is waiting. And, uh, he uh, published a book, a Korean book, titled uh, by uh, uh, Politics of uh, Nuclear 
non-proliferation in Korean. I, I, it's, it's like a Bible. It, it, it has been out for two years. Uh, I, I'm uh, advertising to you. And uh, he is now uh, in, in, at the Korean Academy of Diplomatic, uh, uh, Korea <laughs> National Diplomatic Academy. And he will talk about the Russian uh, Ukraine war and its implications on global nuclear governance. Dr. Zhang, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> In fact, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we uh, built, uh, established uh, Korea National, and uh, no, I am the nuclear. Korea Nuclear Policy yes. Association Society. in around uh, 2012, 13, uh, after uh, the Second. Seoul Nuclear Security Summit. At the time, uh, Dr. Lee and uh, Professor Han and uh, Professor Im, we were getting together uh, to to uh, to help to advise government on this uh, uh, nuclear security policy issues, and also we were uh, uh, hosting the side event of uh, uh, expert summit. Uh, ever since uh, we are kind of. Uh, uh, team working together on these uh, nuclear issues here. Uh, here is a, a, a couple of questions. I can uh, answer all of them in full, but I try to address them. You know why, in, especially in Korea, you know this uh, 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 Ukraine uh, war was really uh, shocking. You know, we a lot of Koreans are feeling that uh, this is uh, uh, invaded because it was. Uh, uh, getting rid of uh, its own nuclear weapons that inherited from the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, it was, uh, so I was, uh, I will be talking briefly, you know, at the time in 1993, uh, Professor John Mearsheimer, a uh, very uh, renowned, uh, uh, you know, political realist, and who was uh, claiming that, uh, you, know, you know, Ukraine should keep the weapons at the time. And while uh, all others, all others, proper, probably <laughs> Professor Sagan and <laughs> Steve Miller was saying that uh, you know they should be uh, uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons, uh, especially in 1993 and 4. It was a post Cold War era. You know the people are you know having a high hope for you know world global peace, global you know non uh, disarmament and non-proliferation, but. Uh, uh, John Scheimer was a very uh, strange voice at the time. But now people are more listening to him. But uh, I want to uh, argue with him whether he's right or not. And uh, uh, what are uh, nuclear armor disarmament, disarmament and non-proliferation implications of this uh, Ukraine war? And uh, how do you understand that, uh, this uh, Russia the threat of use of nuclear weapons? And uh, what are causes of this uh, disintegration of global uh, nuclear governance and uh, what should be done uh, to address them? It has been already discussed uh, uh, earlier uh, by our uh, you know, this, uh, prominent scholars attending here, but uh, I try to uh, answer them of my own. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Ukraine war was really shocking to us for most uh, of us living in this uh, modern era was uh, thinking that the war could be possible only in, you know, in where there is a, a, a internal civil wars or terrorism. But uh, this kind of international war among very normal states uh, were very unusual at this time. But it was uh, uh, shocking to all Koreans as well. Uh, but however, uh, looking back, as was said, uh, uh, Stephen Miller was saying this uh, uh, symptom of uh, this integration of this uh, 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 international nuclear regime was uh, visible since uh, uh, for almost uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, but uh, uh, I would say that since the turn of the century, a uh, lot of uh, uh, scholars and the politicians has been warning, have been warning that uh, uh, this uh, return of uh, great power politics 
and uh, the some uh, the dis disintegration of uh, uh, international order uh, post war and the post post cold war era post cold war era international order was uh, disintegrating and also this include the international nuclear order nuclear order was also uh, somewhat uh, collapsing uh, there was uh, uh, serious uh, warnings for all the way by mostly inter you know international political scientists and also among them there was a warning that Korea could be possible and any other you know uh, 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 countries, small and medium-sized countries who are living in this so-called geopolitical fault lines could be victims, victims of a great power politics. And Korea and Ukraine were, of course, uh, one of those uh, uh, possible uh, victims. And uh, once Brzezinski, in his uh, uh, book of uh, geopolitics, uh, Grand Chessboard, uh, he was saying that uh, Korea and uh, uh, Ukraine could be uh, next, uh, uh, who are living in this uh, uh, geopolitical pivots, uh, could be a, you know, encountering very problematic situations. And also, uh, there was uh, another warnings uh, by uh, uh, NGOs. Uh, this, uh, this was done by the uh, 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 scientists, the nuclear scientists, uh, that uh, they are uh, uh, presenting doomsday clock uh, every year. Uh, uh, since uh, 2020, they said that the doomsday clock is uh, uh, only 100 seconds to midnight. Uh, they are meaning the, this, uh, uh, you know, nuclear Armageddon or uh, apocalypse. And uh, since then, they are maintaining this 100 seconds last year and this year again too. Uh, they say that this is uh, not uh, getting better or getting stable. Uh, what they want to point out uh, by maintaining this uh, 100 seconds was that uh, this uh, uh, serious crisis situation is continuing and getting worse. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, probably you know of uh, the Jared Diamond, who was the author of uh, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, who used to study, you know, he's an anthropologist, and uh, he was studying how these uh, you know, civilizations are rising and collapsing. And, uh, you know, he was uh, saying that, uh, you know, after this uh, virus, uh, was coronavirus was, uh, was uh, spreading, he keep talking to us that the uh, human civilization is not going to disappear because of virus, but we could disappear because of nuclear war or climate change or exhaustion of uh, uh, resources or a uh, you know, man-made disaster could uh, wipe out uh, our uh, uh, people. So he was uh, again uh, uh, talking to us the, the seriousness of uh, uh, the current situations. And also, uh, UN was uh, keep uh, uh, sending out uh, warnings. And also in 2018, uh, UN, uh, UN Office of uh, Disarmament Affairs uh, published a booklet uh, about this uh, uh, coming dangers. The title was Securing Our Common Future. And the subtitle was an agenda for disarmament. In here, in this book, he was uh, saying that uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, disarmament uh, is uh, uh, in, in a serious jeopardy uh, because there was a dangers of uh, emerging technologies uh, that are very disruptive technologies. And also, he was uh, pointing out uh, very interestingly that uh, post Cold War generations are ignorant of disarmament. People who have lived uh, with uh, these uh, two wars, World War I and II, one and two knows of the serious the dangerous war and dangers of uh, uh, armament, but uh, uh, post Cold War uh, people are uh, very much uh, not knowing uh, the seriousness of those uh, nuclear armaments and uh, arms race. And also, he was pointing out the great power politics, geopolitical competition, returns, and also there is a serious qualitative arms race was undergoing. 
So I will talk about this, how this kind of uh, new situations, and including this uh, uh, Ukraine war, Ukraine war was uh, affecting our this. Uh, uh, for me, the five so-called five issue areas or five pillars of uh, nuclear governance: nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, nuclear security, safety, and the peaceful use of nuclear energy. But let me turn to very briefly about the uh, causes of a crisis of this uh, or uh, nuclear uh, governance. As I mentioned already, the power shift among uh, great powers, that's uh, probably the most uh, underlying and the uh, deep cause of the current situation. And also, secondly, there is a serious destabilization of uh, regional politics. It's not only great power politics game going on, but also or there is in the region. There used to be, you know, you know in Cold War era, uh, you know, Soviet Union and the U.S. was uh, controlling their own realm of influence. And also in the post-Cold War era, the U.S., uh, the, the only super uh, power or hegemon could oversee uh, the global, uh, uh, you know, the, the security environment, the situations. But now, uh, U.S. has a, uh, uh, has a somewhat very much weakened uh, 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 global status, and now we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, power, you know, you know, global uh, powers. You know, you can count the four, five of them, and also there is a, a very much regional powers. All of them are engaging in you know, their own regional political games and regional arms race. If you look at this uh, you know, Northeast Asia, we have very serious arms race going on here. And, uh, and we Koreans used to call it that uh, there is a perfect storm of, uh, you know, as uh, Scott Sega mentioned earlier, that all this uh, intercurrent rivalry and the regional rivalry between China and Japan and uh, China and the US all are, are, are uh, you know, you know having this serious dark cloud of this region. And also, uh, finally, I want to point out that there is a serious uh, rise of assertive nuclear doctrine. Uh, Ukraine war was, uh, we have seen this uh, uh, about uh, uh, some uh, serious damage to the nuclear taboo, and uh, uh, Russia was uh, uh, threatening use of nuclear weapons, and they may think it's effective. And also, uh, you can see that the NATO was uh, hesitating engaging in this uh, situation, make them uh, effective. And also, North Korea was uh, 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 also uh, is also uh, bluffing a very serious, uh, you know, prevent preemptive nuclear doctrine uh, toward the South Korea and the U.S. And uh, this development of uh, low yield nuclear bombs for better field use is also making uh, situations very much, uh, uh, you know, very uh, dangerous. Then what kind of uh, impact or, 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 or effect or implication of these uh, uh, events have on this uh, uh, global nuclear governance, global nuclear uh, governance? First, let me begin with the role of nuclear weapons. Russia was uh, probably thinking, you know, nuclear weapon is effective in deterring NATO's direct intervention and the military, direct military assistance. And also, uh, 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 deterring Ukraine's uh, attack, uh, military strike against uh, uh, Russian uh, soil. You know, there is a lot of uh, bomb shells are going uh, back and forth, but you know, Ukraine is uh, somewhat restraining and hesitating, uh, uh, targeting directly against uh, uh, military target in the Russian soil. I think that's uh, probably because of uh, uh, Russia's uh, threat of use of nuclear weapons. And also, it could be effective in preventing escalation from a local conventional war in Ukraine into a regional uh, NATO-wise uh, nuclear uh, warfare. However, there is uh, some other opinion too. Uh, Russian nuclear weapons failed to deter or prevent uh, Ukraine from attacking on separatist Donbass regions. Uh, despite Russia's nuclear weapons, you know, Ukraine was uh, 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 keep 
uh, uh, striking uh, or trying to gain, regain control of these uh, uh, separatist Donbass regions, and also seeking uh, NATO membership. Uh, the fact that Russia suffers from high human and material loss from this protracted war in Ukraine, despite the nuclear supremacy in the region, shows the limited role and the utility of nuclear weapons. Uh, here, however, negatively, a taboo of direct threat of nuclear use of nuclear weapons is broken. Uh, nuclear, become, nuclear weapons become more usable one than before. And also concerning nuclear disarmament, uh, this event and also all this previous event of this, uh, you know, great power politics and the geopolitical competition uh, somehow helped accelerating uh, nuclear buildup and the modernization by nuclear weapon state. Uh, Steve Miller uh, pointed out this morning that, uh, you know, U.S. is uh, spending about $1.3 trillion dollars to maintain its uh, nuclear uh, advantage against other states. You know, this kind of uh, nuclear competition is uh, it's getting worsening, and I think a Ukraine war would make much worse. Uh, nuclear disarmament regimes and the negotiations and arms control regimes and negotiations among major nuclear weapon states are in disarray. And the INF open skies uh, agreement, and you start uh, those examples. And the uh, nuclear non proliferation, uh, Russia broke this uh, Budapest uh, Memorandum of 1994 that guaranteed the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of uh, Ukraine and invaded Ukraine and somehow and threatened the nuclear, uh, uh, non nuclear uh, uh, Ukraine with uh, nuclear weapons it's going to send out a very serious and negative message to all uh, non-nuclear weapon states. And uh, Ukraine, without the nuclear weapon states, uh, failed to deter Russian invasion and lost its uh, territory. And everybody, every small and medium state in, in, you know, in the world may think uh, they could be next to target. And also serious damage to the NPT regime. More non-nuclear weapon states would seek nuclear capability and at least the latency. Just like in Korea during the last uh, a few months, a new uh, public poll showed that the, the, the public support for nuclear weapon uh, development and projection is the highest uh, uh, during the last 10 years. Uh, it's, it's reaching about up to 70%. Uh, and the nuclear umbrella states, uh, those uh, uh, allies of the uh, uh, you know, U.S. would seek much stronger nuclear umbrella, nuclear sharing, uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, those are what uh, Korea is, South Korea is seeking at the moment. And uh, nuclear risk, uh, use risk is, uh, uh, is uh, increasing also. Uh, tense uh, uh, security situations, threats of use, of use of nuclear weapons, high alert level and readiness of nuclear weapons, uh, could be uh, those uh, problems. And uh, what would be a lesson for North Korea? And uh, probably North Korea might have uh, uh, gotten again that uh, the utility of nuclear weapons uh, to deter South Korea and ROK alliance attack. And also, it may, they may think that this is uh, uh, very effective uh, in preventing the reinforcement of U.S. forces, just like NATO is hesitating in helping Ukraine. So in case of South Korea, you know, we have only about 2,500 2500, U.S. forces here. So when there is a war situation, we are expecting a massive reinforcement of U.S. forces from either Japan and, and U.S. mainland. But uh, when uh, North Korea has uh, nuclear weapons and the tactical nuclear weapons, they may think that they may prevent uh, U.S. reinforcement uh, 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 toward uh, South Korea. And also, DPRK was re-emphasized, again saying they are aggressively, very aggressive, uh, preemptive nuclear uh, attack doctrine. I think uh, probably North Korea is the only country in the world who are uh, 
having this uh, so-called preemptive, no, pre preemptive nuclear strike doctrine. And also, DPRK is uh, uh, developing low-yield tactical nuclear weapons in addition to those uh, nuclear arsenals that they already have. Then what will be this, uh, what is the lesson for, what are those lessons for South Korea? Uh, South Korea was increasing in Korea. Uh, we are seeing this much higher public support for nuclear armament, uh, up to 70% this year. It used to be around 60-something. Uh, and also, there is a very strong uh, public and the political support for uh, nuclear sharing and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, reintroduction of uh, nuclear weapons, tactical U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons. Also, there is a very dramatic change of our North Korea policies. Uh, as you know, the, our previous president, President Moon, has a very strong and a higher priority on uh, uh, peace regime building. Uh, for uh, to induce uh, denuclearization, but uh, this uh, Yun government is not having such a strong interest in denuclearization negotiations. But uh, they have uh, their their highest uh, priority is uh, deterrence builder. So it's uh, there is uh, some serious change of uh, uh, our policy positions. Uh, next. Uh, I would say this uh, nuclear security problem. It has been already pre pointed out, uh, you know, pointed out previous that uh, Russia attacked uh, peaceful nuclear uh, facilities in Zaporia, Chernobyl, uh, and uh, that could have uh, uh, leading to a major nuclear and radiological incidents. I think this is a very serious violation of uh, a nuclear security regime. Uh, so. We need a much stronger, uh, much stronger deterrent, uh, uh, deterrence or international regime for protecting uh, peaceful nuclear facilities. I would. Uh, uh, this is uh, my uh, my uh, last point uh, before I am coming to a couple of my suggestions. I want to have uh, my own point about this uh, uh, Mearsheimer's uh, argument for the. Uh, Ukraine's nuclear uh, uh, armament. But as was uh, pointed out to Professor Sagan earlier, I think uh, Ukraine made a choice at the time. Ukraine was a newly independent uh, country, have a very you know, fragile sovereignty, very fragile territorial integrity. So their priority was uh, to be recognized as a very normal, responsible member in international society. How do they do it? As long as they are keeping nuclear weapons, they could be one of a pariah state. So in order to be recognized as an international member, and in order to, so that they could be, their, their fragile independence, very young independence, could be well protected, they had to enter NPT first. That's their choice. And also, there, I think there was some big debate. There was, a, a, you know, Ukraine had a huge rocket industry. So they want to be part of a MTCR and they want to buy and sell their uh, uh, rocket system. Then they have to be, uh, uh, you know, an MPT member. So there was a lot of, the, I think they had some debates among themselves whether they were going to keep the weapons or not. So they were probably the last uh, uh, among three uh, uh, former Soviet states who gave up the weapons. Uh, but so I want to emphasize that uh, Ukraine probably at this moment, they may regret it. But I think, uh, you know, all in all, they are having all these uh, calculations, you know, uh, diplomatic, economical, their, you know, their, their trade relations, and also uh, becoming a, a member of an international society, probably they might have chosen to give up the weapons instead of keeping them. That was uh, uh, the kind of point that I want to make. And uh, finally, uh, I think uh, we need to, uh, there should be uh, this uh, so-called, uh, you know, strategic stability among great powers should be restored. Otherwise, 
there is always a mess. You know, just like this, when the greater powers stop talking each other and just uh, uh, keep focusing on uh, building more nuclear weapons, uh, more weapons, then it, they are not going to, uh, uh, you know, as long as they are in that situation, our this MPT regime will be in disarray. So I want to just say that uh, we need to, you know, it, it could be the one of the darkest mom, moment in uh, this uh, uh, nuclear non-proliferation regime and disarmament regime, but I believe that, uh, you know, previously also we have this kind of situations in the 1960s and also 70s. In the 60s, there was a, a, a great potential for uh, nuclear proliferation, as also mentioned, about the 20 five countries about to have weapons. In the also 70s and 80s, there is about 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world. That's too many to overkill, you know, killing you know, this global many, many times. But we overcome somehow, come to our region and we could maintain our somewhat reasonable, though it's imperfect, global nuclear non-proliferation and the disarmament regime. So again, I hope that uh, we, we, we may return to uh, some, uh, to our region and uh, we return to, there is a lot of uh, a great documents that we need to uh, benchmarking and referring to. Uh, there is uh, 13 practical steps on non-proliferation disarmament adopted the uh, 2000 MPT uh, review conference and also uh, uh, 2000, there is a Stockholm Initiative uh, which have uh, uh, published a document about stepping stones for advancing nuclear disarmament. This is uh, a very practical step-by-step -step approach, uh, approaches uh, uh, supported by many non-nuclear weapon states. I think those are another great documents uh, for uh, 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 benchmarking. And also, there should be you know, send initiative uh, creating environment for nuclear disarmament and the P5 processes should be resumed and also there should be more innovative approaches. Uh, I better, I think, stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the, I'll open up the floor to take your questions to uh, first to the two uh, two scholars in the United States. You you pin uh, pinpoint the person you are going to give a question to. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Francisca. Hmm. And uh, thank you for sharing an interesting perspective on this subject. My question relates to one of the suggestions that you have made uh, that United Nations General Assembly may be urged or it may urge states to um, report their nuclear postures or if there is any change in their nuclear postures or policies. So I was wondering about the effectiveness and implementation of uh, these suggestions on two accounts. One, as we know that uh, nuclear postures and nuclear doctrines are somewhat, the, some of the content of these policies are confidential and that again remains uh, to be changed if time necessitates. And when it comes to the crisis-like situation, we see that uh, such postures and policies may take backseat and states would be made to, uh, to act according to the situation as per the requirement. My second uh, concern is associated with the definitional issue of uh, like credible minimum deterrence or the minimum credible deterrence. Mm -hmm. As we see that what is credible for one state would not be credible for the other. And when it comes to minimum, what is minimum for one state would not be minimum for the other state. So how to deal with this dilemma when we are actually uh, focusing on this uh, posture thing. Thank you very much. Dr. Giovanni. Thank you. I, I, I think this is a fantastic question. And uh, so my, my proposals were precisely to push for this kind of questions and discussions. Um, I think it is time 
especially after the Ukraine war, there has been a tendency to say negative security assurances do not work. You know, there's nothing we can do about, you know, for non-nuclear weapon states and, you know, let's retrench. And he said, my argument is no, I, I think we need to actually double down here because it is in the interest of everyone to have an international community of countries that feel protected without the urge of running and to acquire nuclear weapons if they have the capabilities to do so. I actually want to mention a couple of things about the UN General Assembly that I think is really important in this moment in time. And I want to do it because I think your generation uh, it might find new hope in the system of the UN, um, especially after the Ukraine war. What happened on April uh, 27th, uh, at the UN General Assembly was unprecedented. There was a proposal by Denmark, supported by a bunch of other countries around the world, that basically passed a political resolution for the first time, where the UN General Assembly asserted the right to demand justification to any member of the UN Security Council that applies veto on resolutions that have humanitarian or international peace and security consequences. So it is the very first time that the UN General Assembly is reverting the power dynamics between the Assembly and the UN Sec Security Council, arguing that the UN Security Council is no longer the legitimate vehicle for guaranteeing world, the world order. What you are arguing is a very good point. How far should we ask nuclear weapon states to disclose information and details? I want to go back to something that was cited already before, which is the Swedish initiative of the steps, step by step approach to nuclear disarmament. The idea for the Swedish is to begin using the UN General Assembly. This used to be the NPT uh, avenue. But the NPT is now blocked for various reasons. And so the Swedes have made the, the uh, proposal to shift the political discussions at the UN General Assembly. And the very first thing that they've asked is, let's not only corner the P5, right? The nuclear weapon states, the legitimate nuclear weapon states. Let's try to make each nuclear weapon processor accountable to each other. So it's not so much the information that you give to nuclear weapon states, but it is the kind of information you choose to, to disclose with your peer nuclear weapon states. There are, there are going to be, of course, limitations in what nuclear weapon states decide to disclose, but it is really important what they, cho what they chose not to disclose that might ac actually suggest a potential change in their posture or in their thinking. And again, it is a way to create a system of accountability vis-a-vis -vis the international community, vis-a-vis -vis each other. Plenty of limitations in that proposal. I also said in my article, you know, none of these proposals would have then stopped President Putin, quite frankly, from invading Ukraine. But I think what is important is we start reconsidering the UN system and evaluating nuclear behavior and nuclear responsibility as part of the veto power of these countries. I think that is the shift that needs to happen. But thank you for your question. I think it's a great one. Or other question to Dr. Giovanni? Okay. Uh, my question is... Sorry. Uh, I am Iftakhar Ali from Pakistan. My question is again uh, with Francisca. Hello. And uh, that is uh, uh, with reference to the upcoming uh, NPT review conference. Um, uh, that this debate is mostly revolving around and the uh, possible use of nuclear weapons, the um, divide of great powers, um, uh, you know, uh, the great division between Russia and the United States, and the possible use of uh, any attack on uh, Iranian nuclear facilities or maybe the North Korean issues. So do you think that this review conference would be, uh, you know, uh, producing a fruitful result uh, or whether it would not be another failure uh, like the previous uh, review conferences, uh, though there, are, there were so many hopes that this review conference would bring some positive changes, uh, but still, um, you know, uh, a person like me is 
do not see any hope that this review conference would gain uh, any positive results for the you know uh, for the disarmament the, you know they are not the, uh, the all debate you, the scholars have said that there is a renewed modernization and refurbishing of the nuclear weapons so there is a complete disregard uh, to the clause um, article 6 and uh, how would these great powers would be able to convince the non-nuclear weapon states uh, that they should still commit to uh, you know uh, this great bargain where uh, they on one side they are not ready to uh, fulfill their own commitment and on the other side they are coercing other nations to um, you know go for nuclearization if we talk about iran or maybe north korea again the question is that if the article uh, 10 or 11 if if that allows a country to withdraw from a treaty like NPT based on its security threats. So uh, do you think that Iran would be, um, you know, using the same pathway uh, that it will seek withdrawal if uh, that is pushed too far? Or even if Iran goes for nuclear, would there be any domino effect in the Middle East? You know, uh, don't you think that uh, these coercive uh, strategies are more dangerous, uh, you know, for the greater health and prosperity of non-proliferation regime. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll try to address some of your questions. Um, and I, I hear from, from your voice and I share the same concerns. We are all a little bit pessimistic. But I want to actually say, I want to start with one, uh, one piece of, in my view, good news. So I want to talk about your country for a second. So what not many people know about, about Pakistan is that Pakistan has been one of the most uh, vocal nuclear weapon possessing country to promote the idea of a universally binding commitment by all nuclear weapon states and possessing states to negative security assurances to non-nuclear weapon states. Pakistan is also an observer to the CTBTO, to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, which I worked for uh, for two years. So again, I think it, there are some nuclear weapon states that right now are looking at the situation and they are actually trying to advance more of a bridge building, uh, um, you know, position with the non-nuclear weapon states. So I think we need to build on what we have. Do I believe that the MPT review conference will achieve much? No, I think, uh, but I, but I think I see one area where there could be some some advancements. So let me mention that, in my view, my concern about the MPT is that he is now subjected to a lot of uh, centrif centrifugal forces. Um, you have seen, for example, several debates and negotiations now being taken out of the MPT review conference. One example is the Middle East nuclear weapon free zone. And the negotiations now are back with the UN General Assembly because the Arab states believe the MPT cannot achieve anything. The TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, was also concluded outside of the MPT uh, review conference or the MPT process. And this entire discussion that you are, you are mentioning about modernization, again, modernization is not something the nuclear weapon states will bring to the table at the MPT review conference. In that sense, what you're seeing is more fragmentation. There is also going to be a new fragmentation happening, which is really within the P5. Normally, the P5 has always come to the table with the, during the MPT review conference with, you know, they are like, common declaration of statement and so on and so forth. You are not going to see any of this this year. So the P5 has also been fractured. Um, and that leaves a lot of clusters, groups with different interests. I do see, however, one, uh, one point in common between the non-nuclear weapon states and the nuclear weapon states. And it is in the area of risk reduction. Tong and others have done a lot of work on nuclear risk reduction among nuclear weapon states, but I do see it as an area where also no nuclear weapon states are really concerned today. And so there are some forces also in the nuclear disarmament community trying to push some of the uh, more middle center, more, let's just say, um, conservative, if you want, non-nuclear weapon states to 
put aside for a second the demand for nuclear disarmament and instead push the nuclear weapon states to agree on nuclear risk reduction strategies. This is something we all can agree on, right? Yes, we want a world free of nuclear weapons, but the first thing we want is not to be blown out, you know, uh, by a nuclear war. And so the nuclear risk reduction space, in my view, allows for a lot of potential steps where non-nuclear weapon states will become really important. So you can expect Brazil, you can expect Mexico, Sweden, for example, to do a bunch of work on risk reduction, uh, which normally they wouldn't do. In that sense, I do expect a convergence. On Iran, no, I think Iran will stay in the MPT for as long as it needs. Um, I think Iran in this moment has, uh, uh, you know, some grievances, and rightly so. It was the United States withdrawing from the JCPOA, and I think the Iranians have no interest in leaving the MPT at this point. Uh, I think the Iranians have been a force to reckon with on, on many different levels. They are very skillful negotiators but they will not make the mistake of leaving the MPT for the time being because it also serves their purpose. So I think in that sense, you are not going to see a lot of progress on nuclear non-proliferation or nuclear disarmament, but you will see in that gray area. One last point I want to make, which is very important. If you haven't read this statement delivered by uh, Director General Grossi, uh, do take a look at it because an area of convergence that is now emerging is obviously on the third pillar of the NPT, which is on nuclear energy and peaceful use of nuclear energy. And in that sense, because of the climate change, you might see a lot of countries like with nuclear technology being more open to collaboration with other countries who are seeking that technology. Can I uh, ask uh, Belfast Center or Dr. Giovanni to take the lead in holding uh, Third UN special disarmament session, like uh, we did in the first uh, UN uh, disarmament special session in 1968 and 1978, uh, by adopting you know negative security assurance and positive security assurance over there. But after you know 50 years later, now Russia as a P5 member. Threatening to use nuclear weapons in a non-nuclear weapon state, and so we we need to have some special session for disarmament in the United Nations to talk about this and to re-educate P5 members about their obligations, responsibility in in the in, in the world, right, as a nuclear weapon state. They they are enjoying their their right of a nuclear weapon state, but not discharging their responsibility and accountability. Right? We have to re renew, re educate them to fulfill their uh, uh, responsibility as a P five members. Right? Yeah. So would you take the lead, or would you ask other well, countries? We need we need South Koreans and the member states to take the lead. But you said something really important. It is time for a, a, for a new uh, UN okay. UN resolution on the negative security assurances, and countries like South Korea, Japan, but many others can really be the bridge builders on this. And okay. because of the strong alliance that you have with the United States, I think you have a much better chance that smaller non-nuclear weapon states to be listened to. So I think it is time for a political declaration, no doubt, no doubt about this. Okay, let's have a collect questions for Dr. Chao, Tung Chao. Ask question. Okay, over there. In general? To a specific person. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, my name is Hongo Kang, and I'm currently doing PhD program under Dr. Yim. And uh, I just have a general question for the speakers. It's just an opinion. Mm -hmm. We've basically been talking about uh, nuclear governance, but, uh, and my research topic actually is about nuclear severe accident. We don't think it's going to happen. And it's really li not likely to happen, but it did happen, you know, in Fukushima, for example. And I didn't think 
a lot, I, I think a lot of people didn't think war in Ukraine was going to happen, but it did happen. So my question is, what if Russia uses even a single nuclear weapon in a war in Ukraine? What do you think NATO and U.S. will do? And I'm not talking about what, they, what you guys think they should do, but what do you think they will do? What do you guys think? I, I do have an opinion on that too, but I, I'd like to hear opinions of speakers on that. Dr. Tung Chao, do you have any idea? Um, I'm happy to share my personal view on this. Um, it looks like, um, well, of course, it depends on uh, a lot of uh, specifics, uh, including uh, how uh, Russia used uh, the nuclear weapon, uh, what target uh, it uh, was used against, and what's the uh, destruction and, and human parity as a result of the nuclear use. Uh, did Russia uh, uh, conduct a nuclear demonstration attack against uh, you know against uh, open sea that didn't cause a serious uh, human casualty and and uh, asset lost or it uh, you know uh, caused or it used a nuclear weapon against uh, a populated area in Ukraine uh, it also depends on who is in power in the United States and in, and in the key NATO countries. I think uh, the response of the Biden administration would be very different from the response from uh, uh, you know, a second uh, Trump uh, administration, for example. Um, if this happens uh, during the Biden administration, it looks like uh, the U.S. is uh, leaning towards uh, not responding with an American nuclear attack or a NATO nuclear attack. Uh, of course, they will very uh, strongly condemn the Russian nuclear use, but they will try to uh, avoid uh, retaliating with nuclear weapons, but instead uh, continuing uh, to support uh, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, war effort at the conventional level. I think uh, NATO countries might decide to more uh, to get more directly involved uh, at the conventional war against Russia. Uh, but I would imagine uh, they uh, uh, try to avoid uh, uh, following the Russian suit uh, uh, and uh, to use nuclear weapons. Um, I think it, they will certainly impose much stronger economic sanctions, much uh, stronger political pressure on Russia as well. They will impose uh, a lot of uh, more pressure on China, India, and other countries. Um, they you know, might resort to uh, measures to uh, impose uh, domestic political pressure on, on Putin. Uh, there will be more discussions about the need to have a different Russian leader uh, at Kremlin. Um, I, I think that will be the likely uh, Western response. Uh, but this is my very... Uh, preliminary, based on my very, very pre preliminary understanding of uh, American and NATO calculations. Dr. John, you have a response? No? Then ask questions to Dr. John now. Are we allowed to ask questions to Dr. Giovannini still? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then I have a question for her, if that's okay. Um, my name is Owen Webster. I'm a PhD candidate in nuclear engineering uh, at NC State University. Um, so I was very interested to hear you talk about the veto power of the UN Security Council and the P5. 
I didn't honestly know that that was something that was getting seriously discussed anywhere, but I'm very glad that it is. Um, I'm confused, to be honest, about what exactly that would look like and how, what the actual legal process for changing anything like that would be. I kind of assumed, not knowing anything about it, that it would mean dismantling the entire UN and starting over. Um, and, but So I'd like to hear more on that, but I also am curious, you know, where do we draw the line on what is nuclear responsibility? I mean, I, I think in a lot of people's eyes, including my own, possessing nuclear weapons at all, it lends itself to making irresponsible decisions with you know, related to nuclear weapons, right? And, you know, depending on how far we look back historically, I think that you can make arguments for every single one of the P5 states doing things that we would, at least in 2022, consider to be beyond the pale. So, I mean, first I'd like to hear about how that process works, and then I would also like to hear about what's the argument of trying to remove veto power from one of the P5 instead of just getting rid of it for all of them. That seems like it would be a much more permanent solution considering the way that the UN Security Council has sort of operated as an opposition to, I mean, you could argue for the TPNW, for example, it wasn't able to come about through the UN Security Council. It had to come from the General Assembly because of this exact problem, right? So I'd just like to hear more about that. Thank you so much. I I love to be in touch with you. If you can send me also this these questions, I have to tell you. So I'm going to New York next week, and one of the discussions I'm going to have is with first committee and with UN General Assembly, the president, to see what can be done in terms of a political declaration. What you're saying is absolutely right. Is how would it function on the on the legal side? So let me mention a couple of things. Uh, um, I built this proposal not out of the blue, but uh, based on a series of movements on the UN reform, they are actually taking place today. There is a lot of pressure on the UN Secretary General, on his office, and from various states to take seriously the question of uh, the UN reform. Now, my uh, recommendation to the, the President of the General Assembly was, well, how do we define nuclear responsibility? And the proposal is just limited for now for the UN Security Council and the P5 to provide what non-nuclear weapon states have asked for years, which is a universal, legally binding, permanent declaration and commitment of negative security assurances. And that means that if you promise, if you commit that you are not going to use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state, even the simple threat of that, of you of the use of nuclear weapon will be sufficient for you actually to be to, for your veto power to be put on hold what difference would it make well in a sense it is a sort of deterrent system or a constraining system let's call it a, a behavioral a, a behavioral agreement where you start basically linking the the veto power which is the most important function of the un security council with a responsibility of being a nuclear weapon state the proposal does not go as far as saying they, we need to disarm or we need to force the, the P5 to disarm. It's just to say, if you are a nuclear weapon state and you are sitting at the UN Security Council, you've got a global responsibility. And that global responsibility needs to be linked to nuclear responsibility. In this case, it's limited to providing the negative security assurances the non-nuclear weapon states have asked for years. You said something really important that I, I was mentioning this in the article and then I removed it. I wanted actually to mention, to basically make the case that look, this is this idea that the Russian is a nuclear predatory state is not new. All nuclear weapon states have exhibited predatory behaviors, or in some cases, they basically used nuclear coercion. If we even think about the United Kingdom and France, for example, the decision to test in their colonial territories, that could also be, uh, be considered as irresponsible nuclear behavior. So I would, in order to make it more of a political, you know, feasible idea, I would just tie it to the negative security assurances. How can it be done? The General Assembly 
he's already uh, based on the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war is changing a lot and is actually accelerating the pressure for UN reform, precisely because of what happened, uh, you know, with the veto power of, of Russia. Um, the General Assembly is now shifting towards becoming an accountable system for the UN Security Council. They've started already saying, if you are applying veto, veto on a decision that has international consequences, you need to give us an explanation of why that is the case. I think we can go further than this and just say the UN General Assembly can become a real accountable mechanism to track the nuclear behavior of nuclear weapon states and hold them accountable for those decisions. Now, there is a, an obvious question. As the situation as it is today, uh, no changes can be made to the UN unless the UN Security Council accepts this. But I think if you actually tilt the balance and have the UN General Assembly really demanding in in sort of more uni sort of in a, in a uh, collective way certain type of guarantees, I think there is the political space today to do something that can actually move the UN Security Council. You have two organs within the United Nations today, the UN uh, Secretary General's Office and the UN General Assembly that are really determined to make the UN reform. And my argument is let's link it to nuclear risk today. This is the number one priority the UN should have to be a political body. I want to finish with uh, how do we judge responsibility? I think it's really, really important. and. There are many discussions today of what makes the nuclear weapon states a responsible nuclear weapon state. I think the, the work that Scott is doing on ethics, law, and nuclear deterrence is incredibly important. We need to bring back international legal responsibilities, norms. We need to bring back, I think, normative questions. And above all, I think we need to bring back the question of negative security assurances, that you have the right as a non-nuclear weapon state to live in a world without feeling the risk of being completely you know, destroyed just because a nuclear weapon state decides to do so. I think that's the bare minimum that we should expect, and I think the U.S. should bet on this reform immediately. Question to Dr. John. No more to the United States. <laughs> Yeah, please. I, I was planning to ask a question to Professor Tong Zhao, but uh, oh, okay, okay. Zhao. is that okay? <laughs> uh, hi, Professor. Um, my name is uh, CJ from the Philippines, and I have a question about China, actually, because like a few days ago, there was a survey in the Philippines that was released that showed that China is still among the least trusted countries. Uh, of Filipinos with among like among the lowest trust ratings and the highest disapproval ratings, which is consistent with like the last time the survey was held from three years ago. And part of this is uh, attributed to uh, the territorial disputes that China and the Philippines are having in the South China Sea. But there are some uh, there are some portions of the population as well as members of the last two administrations that have been saying that uh, the Philippines should not antagonize China uh, in the South China Sea or else we would end up as another Ukraine. And my question really is like, is there any sort of scenario really where China would have to resort to the kind of nuclear posturing that Russia has been doing uh, in the Ukraine war and is uh, uh, whether that's in the, with the South China Sea or with Taiwan, and um, does China's policy or future policy towards Taiwan and the Ch South China Sea depend at all on what the outcome of the Russia-Ukraine war is going to be? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I think the Ukraine war uh, makes China more willing to consider using the threat of nuclear weapons rather than you know, directly using nuclear weapons to achieve its uh, security goals uh, in the future. Right? We often talk about China's no first use policy, but if we look at the Chinese military doctrines, 
uh, written by very authoritative Chinese military officials, including former uh, deputy commanders of the PLA Second Artillery. Today, it is called the PLA Rocket Force, which operates Chinese nuclear forces. They have this concept, which is called to lower the threshold of nuclear coercion during a crisis. Uh, in other words, you know, the, at least the military is prepared to change China's declaratory policy in a serious conventional war and be ready to threaten nuclear use uh, under certain conditions. Uh, whether China will actually follow through the threat and uh, initiate a nuclear war, I think, is a different question. But at least the military is ready to threaten nuclear use first. Um, I think this uh, interest is going to become stronger uh, in the future because China watched Russia successfully uh, using the threat of nuclear weapons to achieve these uh, security uh, goals uh, below the nuclear uh, threshold. Um, so you know, I think we are likely to see China exercising uh, so-called nuclear uh, flexible and, and uh, smart nuclear signaling. Uh, and we you know, already see some of this uh, in today's uh, a, a Taiwan crisis, right? China released uh, uh, videos for the first time of the launching of its uh, DF-17 hypersonic boost glider missile, which is believed to be nuclear capable by, uh, the, Mer by the US DOD. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, it can you know, conduct uh, nuclear exercises, testing nuclear capable systems, you know, the state media can talk about nuclear weapons in a conventional war. Um, I think China will have a stronger interest in such type of nuclear signaling in a future crisis. But I think China is more likely to uh, get nuclear weapons involved, either through nuclear signaling or to, to threaten nuclear use in a Taiwan Strait crisis rather than in a South China Sea crisis because the stakes for China are much higher uh, regarding Taiwan. It is the issue of national unification. Uh, but South China Sea, it, it also involves territorial integrity for China. But I think after uh, building a number of man-made islands uh, in South China Sea and installing military equipment on those islands, China has already uh, established rather strong uh, military uh, control over key areas of South China Sea. Um, and I, I don't think China feels the need uh, to threaten nuclear use in order to further expand its, its, its physical, physical control um, of the region, uh, unless uh, I think uh, foreign powers, especially the United States, decides to fight China uh, uh, in, a, in a serious military conflict uh, over, uh, over the maritime dispute in South China Sea. Um, otherwise, I think it's harder to imagine uh, Chinese nuclear weapons playing a role in that region. Dr. Zhen, Dr. Zhen. Do we have a final statement? Please. Uh, I just want to add that uh, this uh, 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 Ukraine war was uh, opening a Pandora's box on this uh, uh, nuclear governance. All nuclear issues uh, are in disarray and jeopardized. And uh, we need, uh, you know, another big, big uh, efforts or, or push to to normalize it. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, TPNW was uh, a big winner for uh, non-nuclear weapon states because of this uh, TPNW. I think uh, P5 was uh, somewhat under pressure, so they launched the uh, P5 process. 
to show that they are serious about uh, looking at, serious about uh, you know nuclear disarmament, uh, and also uh, there was uh, as was mentioned the uh, uh, Stockholm Initiative that was uh, trying to you know while there is a, an all or nothing approach is not working very well. They tried to uh, find out some intermediate approach was uh, reducing uh, nuclear risks. But uh, all those efforts are in now, I think, uh, fully uh, stopped because of Ukraine war. So I believe that it's a time we, you know, you know, I, I don't think this, uh, uh, you know, those countries, uh, P5 countries are uh, coming to the table, you know, let's talk about nuclear disarmament. That's not going to happen. I think it's, uh, it's up to non-nuclear weapon state and the civil society and, and uh, NGOs who are raising the issues once again and uh, making them uh, to come to the table for the more uh, compromised solutions. Yeah, I better stop here. Uh, finally, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to mention one more thing. Uh, we talked about the enough uh, about uh, uh, negative security assurance. But I, I'd like to ask one more uh, question to us, uh, not, not exactly uh, pointing to other people, but uh, uh, positive security assurance is to be given to uh, uh, MPT member states who are very faithfully observing MPT. Uh, but uh, after North Korea claimed that they uh, owned uh, nuclear weapons, why Russia and China still provide positive security assurance to North Korea? They have to provide the positive security assurance to South Korea instead of North Korea, right? So we have to raise this question to uh, P5 members again and again, right? So with this, uh, your energy for study is never, never stops. Unless I call adjourning the meeting. Uh, let's uh, give a big applause to the three speakers and, and also us together. Keep Thank you. So both of those of you who are here at Sejong Institute, we're having lunch, but then starting at about 12.50, you notice there are a lot of posters out there. These posters are prepared by the Derek Summer Fellows as an outcome of the group research. And uh, 